recording. Okay. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Um, good evening. It's February 20th. No, it isn't. It mm -hmm. is March 6th. Uh, and this is the regular meeting of the town council. Um, based on the November 7th, 2022 act uh, that extended suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are allowed to hold meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at the meeting location. However, I want to call attention to the fact that nine counselors are in fact planning to be in the room tonight. We're still waiting for one more. Um, the other counselors are remote and therefore fully participating. Um, this meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and is live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 17 and through Amherst Media's live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the March 6th, 2020, 2023 town council meeting to order at 634. Um, I'll call upon each counselor by name. At that time, you should unmute their, your mic and say present. This will indicate that you can hear us and we can hear you. Please remember to mute your mic afterwards. Um, Shalini Balmel is not present at this time, but she is expected. Pat DeAngelis? Present. Anna Devlin Gothier? Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke? Present. Monique Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Present. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. And if we need to, uh, we will uh, either make note of that or stop the meeting until we can correct the technical difficulties. If you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please use the raise hand button. Um, before moving to announcements, I want to review the revised order of the agenda tonight. And note, we have added a specific public comment period in addition to the general public comment period. This specific public comment period is associated with item 8A. After this, we, after I finish talking about the agenda and Athena is going to show the order of the agenda on the screen, uh, we will move immediately to announcements. There are no hearings tonight. And if time allows before we move on to our special guests, we will move to the consent agenda. Around 6.45 or 6.50, we expect Senator Comerford and Representative Dom to join us in the town room. The memo in the council's packet lays out the ex expectations for the por that portion of the meeting. We have asked them to be with us for at least an hour, but they are always welcome to join us at any time and for all of our meetings. After that, we will have general public comment. There will be a second specific public comment in relationship to agenda item 8A. Proposed amendments to town council rules of procedure rules 3.2, 5.1 and 5.2. I'm asking now and will do so again, that if at all possible for the public wishing to make comments about the proposed rules of procedure, that you save your comments for that specific public comment. When we get to item 8A, the item will first be introduced and counselors will have a first round of discussion. We will then have specific public comment and we will not vote until after that specific public comment. And that, mo that vote may be to adopt, it may be to change, it may be to refer back to GOL. We will proceed with the remainder of the meeting as it appears on the posted agenda. I want to ask now whether counselors have any questions about 
the order of the agenda. Okay, I'm seeing no hands. Then we're going to move to announcements. Our next regular meeting is on March 20th, 2023, obviously at 6.30. And we will be having a town council retreat on March 25th from 8.30 to 1.30 p.m. Uh, there's various upcoming council committee meetings and district meetings as well. Uh, you'll see both all of those on the screen. However, I'd like to take a moment to show the announcement for the screening of the big payback and a discussion with former Evanston altar woman, Robin Rue Simmons. This is sponsored by the AHRA. It's on March 30th, 2023 at 6 p.m. on the um, Amherst College campus. Amherst College campus, right, okay. Uh, please consult the boards and committees calendar and other community events calendar on the town website. We are going to move now to the consent agenda. And I, the following items were selected. If you wanna remove an item, please state so after I've gone through the initial list. And in doing so, um, we will put that item aside. That does not require a second, okay? Also, I want to just ask um, on Athena's behalf, if you have any questions on any of the minutes, rather than try to edit them in the meeting, just have them removed and we'll have an opportunity for people to provide edits otherwise, okay? So the motion is followed to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Um, 6A, adoption of the 2023 Tibetan National Uprising Day Proclamation. 6B, adoption of the 2023 Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month Proclamation. 6C, amendment to a previously adopted resolution affirming the town of Amherst commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity for black residents. 8A, adoption of proposed amendments to Town Council Rules of Procedure, Rule 3.2, 5.1, and 5.2. 11A to H, approval of the following meeting minutes, and they are listed on your screen. Are there requests to remove an item? Pat DeAngelis. Oh, Pat, please use your mic. I would like to remove item 8A. Okay. 8A is removed from the consent agenda. Are there any other items? Pa Anna? No? Okay. No, nope, just wasn't fast enough. Okay. So I'm with that, we're removing item 8A on this list. And uh, therefore, I'm looking for a second for the um, amendments for the consent agenda. Is there Shane, a second? Shane seconds. Okay. With 8A removed. Yes. Thank you. Any other further discussion or comment? Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote. First of all, Shalini, can you hear us? Yes, I can. And we can hear you, and you'll be coming on the screen as soon as possible. You brought your computer, right? Thank you. Okay. Uh, it, in terms of the consent agenda, are you an aye or what? Okay. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Jennifer, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I'm and far Alicia, away, I'm sorry. Alicia Walker. Yes. 
Thank you. All right. Uh, we did do um, the resolutions. And so I'm actually going to, while we're waiting for Senator Comerford to join us, I'm going to ask um, Shalini Balmilne to read the last paragraphs of the resolution with regarding to the Tibetan uh, celebration of their uprising. Okay, sure. Um, so I just want to first acknowledge the members of the Tibet, our Tibetan community who are in residence. Thank you for being here. And our state rep, Mindy Dom, thank you for being here, joining us this evening. Uh, so these are the last three um, paragraphs from the proclamation. Now, therefore, we, the town council of the town of Amherst in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, recognizes the local Tibetan American community's plea for justice for the people of Tibet on the 64th anniversary of Tibetan National Uprising Day and continues to proclaim each March, March 10th as Tibet Day and further recognizes this proclamation by raising the Tibetan national flag from March 10th to March 20th, 2023, to help cultivate awareness for all residents of Amherst. And further, to pay tribute to 154 self-immolated Tibetans among the brave men and women who have given their lives for the cause of freedom in Tibet, members of the Regional Tibetan Association of Massachusetts, based in Amherst, will hold a flag-raising ceremony at 9 a.m. on March 10th, 2023, in front of the Amherst Town Hall and a walk for Tibet from Amherst to Northampton. And further, that the clerk of the town council shall cause copies of this proclamation be sent to President Biden of the United States, Massachusetts Senators Markey and Warren, Massachusetts Representative McGovern, Governor Healy of Massachusetts, the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights in Geneva, Switzerland, and Penpa Searing, uh, President of the Central Tibetan Administration. Uh, so I just want to again uh, invite everyone to join Town Council on March 10th at 9 a.m. And I also wanted to share that there is um, a renowned poet, writer, and Tibetan activist who is visiting Amherst or at the Pioneer Valley. And so he did a kickoff kickoff event at Hampshire College yesterday, and there are two more events. One will be in April, uh, so please look out for that. And there is one tomorrow. Uh, this is Tenzin Shunju. His uh, latest book, Nowhere to Call Home, he will be there at Odyssey Bookstore tomorrow at 7 p.m. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we're going to also then have the 2023 Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month proclamation. Uh, the last paragraph, Mandy Jo Hannity. Thank you. Um, now, therefore, the Amherst Town Council hereby proclaims the month of April to be Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month and further recognizes this proclamation by raising the child abuse prevention flag from April 3rd, 2023 to April 30, 2023 to help cultivate awareness for all residents of Amherst. And it is my understanding that that flag raising ceremony will be on April 3rd at 2.30 p.m. in front of Town Hall. Outstanding, thank you. Uh, and I just wanna mention the other one that we voted on. It was uh, a request of Councillor uh, Michelle Miller back when we passed this. Uh, she brought it to us. She worked closely with, uh, as a representative and co-founder of um, Reparations for Amherst, and she requested that Reparations for Amherst be added as a community sponsor. At that time, we were not listing community sponsors on proclamations, and so it was just that addition. Um, so with that, I would like to welcome uh, Senator Joe Comerford. I'm sorry. Do we want to invite our guests from the Tibetan community if they'd like to come and say, say a few words? Thank you. Please come forward. Thank you, Shalini. You need to push the button to make sure the microphone is 
on and keep your finger on it. You have to hold it. I have to hold it. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. And thank you so much for all your support for our Tibet cause. My name is Jamba. I'm the elected uh, vice president of the T uh, Regional Tibetan Association of Massachusetts. Thank you so much again. Oh, hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tsering Tsering Pinzo. Uh, I live in Sunderland. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, thanks for all the support that you have given to us. Really appreciate it. It means a lot to us. And uh, I've been elected as an accountant for the next two years for the Regional Tibetan Association. Thank you very much. Great. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Pondup Tsering. Uh, member of the local Tibetan community. Um, again, want to acknowledge and thank the town council for supporting this proclamation and raising of the Tibetan national flag. Um, I think this truly uh, is not only um, giving hope to Tibetans uh, in exile, but more importantly, to the Tibetans inside occupied Tibet. And so this proclamation means a lot. Uh, and I just want to highlight just three elements of this proclamation that I think uh, is critical. Um, one of the elements in this proclamation is the mass de and collection of Tibetans inside Tibet and two institutions, the Human Rights Watch and the Citizens Lab at the University of Toronto have done a study on this to confirm that from 2016 up to this point of time, Tibetans, young children, women, monks are being forced to give their blood samples for this DNA collection. And in this process, uh, a Massachusetts-based company, um, Thermo Fisher Scientific, which is based in Waltham, has been involved in terms of support supply DNA sequence equipment and tools. Um, there was a report in way back in 2019 by the Human Rights Watch Committee, uh, which found these uh, DNS, DNA sequence equipment being sold in the uh, Xinjiang Uyghurs Autonomous Region. Uh, and in 2019, that they said that they would stop doing it any further. Um, and a New York a report found that even in 2021, they were selling still these equipments. Uh, you might wonder why this is such a big deal. Um, part of the reason for this is in addition to the six decades of repression, annexation or occupation of Tibet, China has launched an enhanced biometric and DN collection of surveillance. And so if somebody finds a picture of a Dalai Lama or a national flag or a flyer that says free Tibet in the streets of Amdu or the capital city of Tibet, Chinese police can do a test and based on the DNA um, identification, they would be able to arrest this Tibetan. And so this is a matter of deep concern to us. Um, and we hope that um, the elected leaders uh, in the state will call upon Thermo Fisher to be more responsible. Uh, we certainly have no uh, reservations of them doing any business uh, elsewhere, but I think when it is, uh, when they become an accomplice, either wittingly or unwittingly, an accomplice of human rights abuse, I think that's definitely a concern for all of us. The second issue that I want to highlight and uh, which I'm very happy to share is that Congressman Jim McGovern had introduced the uh, Tibetan Promoting Tibetan uh, Resolution uh, Act um, on January 26th. And as of today, uh, there are six co-sponsors of this resolution. Um, 
this resolution essentially calls for United States government to recognize that Tibet was historically an independent nation from ancient times, contrary to Chinese propaganda. This resolution also calls that based on international law, Tibetans have a right to self-determination and their right must be respected. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, there have been six sponsors of this bill as of today, and I know there will be many more, but I want to take this opportunity to request our elected Massachusetts U.S. House of Congress representatives uh, to sort of be the leaders in supporting this resolution. Um, and finally, uh, this is somewhat of a, a good news, but also again reflected in this uh, proclamation uh, is um, the fact that the Chinese government has forcibly removed young Tibetan children, some as young as age of four years, from their Tibetan homes, taken away to this so-called colonial boarding school so that they can be given a, a Chinese education and be totally be removed from their Tibetan culture, Tibetan language, Tibetan tradition in a way to sort of really indoctrinate these future uh, Tibetan uh, young children um, so that they cannot speak Tibetan language, they cannot communicate with their family. And in this regard, the United Nations Commission on, um, let's see, Commissions on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights just recently held a meeting in Geneva on February 15 and 16, uh, closely uh, questioning the Chinese government regarding this. And they've issued a report today which calls for the immediate closure of these colonial boarding schools and for authorization and allowing Tibetans to start uh, Tibetan private schools in, in, in Tibet. So I think this is a great victory for the children of Tibet. I think we'll have to wait and see if China, who is a key member of the United Nations, will actually follow uh, uh, some of these, the findings of their own UN body. Finally, I want to take this opportunity once again to thank all the council members for supporting this proclamation. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Senator Joe Comerford and Representative Mindy Dam, um, who are their representatives, will be joining us on March 10th, Tibetan National Uprising Day. And this really means a lot to us. And thank you very much for your support once again. Thank you for joining us this evening and we'll see you on Friday. Thank you. So at this point, uh, I would like to welcome Senator Joe Comerford and Representative Mindy Dom. We're going to ask them to come up and sit side by side right here in the town room with us. And thank you for joining us in person. Athena, yes. I'm just noticing that we lost Alicia. So I'm wondering if we can, oh, here she is. I just want to confirm that she can hear us. Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, welcome. And for the purposes of the audience and those of us here, there are nine counselors in the room. There are four other counselors on uh, Zoom. We are all present tonight. In addition to that, uh, with the we have four other people in our audience, and we have 20, 30 people on Zoom in our audience, as well as other people who are watching uh, on Amherst Media or live streaming. Okay. Yeah, we've been doing it this way for over a year, so it's very proud of how much we've tried to open ourselves back up after the pandemic. So. We're going to start with a presentation, and then we've provided a couple initial questions, and then some questions that other counselors or the counselors might have in addition. So 
The floor is yours. I'm sorry, Lynn. Um, Zoom can't hear uh, Senator Comerford and, and Rep. Dom. Thank you. Do I put my finger down? I do my finger. Good, good, good. Or I can just hand this over to you. Yeah. Is this better? Can people hear now? Yes, we're getting a thumbs up on that one. Okay. Okay, I'm on top of it. Literally. <laughs> so thank you so much for inviting us. Um, I also, I'm going to say this throughout the presentation, and I want to really extend this invitation again and again to the town council. You don't have to wait four years or two terms or a pandemic to have us come back and uh, give a report on what we're doing and tell us what you want us to be doing. Please consider doing this at least once a year. Um, and so you can tell us what's on your mind and it makes us better advocates and it makes us more successful on behalf of the town. So that's an open invitation. Please take us up on it. Um, we've created a presentation that's going to go through a little bit about um, the logistics sort of of the, of the legislative process just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then Joe and I are going to share um, what our committees are and just some highlights from bills. We received some concerns in advance that counselors provided to us. Thank, Thank you. you for that. We're going to address some of those. And if we don't address it completely, I'm going to trust that folks are going to say, wait, you didn't answer it, or we need more information. We have paper, pen, computers to take down questions. And um, we hope to make this really a productive conversation. I'm thrilled to be here. Joan, did you want to say anything? I'll just join uh, Mindy in thanking you so much for making the time. I love representing Amherst with Mindy Dom, uh, and I really so much appreciate the tireless work of this council and the staff, and of course the school committee as well, all the public bodies that make Amherst work, municipal governance. We say this to Lynn a lot because we get to speak with Lynn. It is so hard to do what you're doing, and so it is an honor to work shoulder to shoulder with Mindy on, on behalf of Amherst and trying to be the best allies and advocates we can be for you. And if I can just repeat that, I won't make it too much of a love fest, but um, feeling the same way about working with the council, but also you'll hear tonight that Senator Comerford and I are a team and we're a very strong, deep partnership. Um, so we support each other in advocating and representing um, Amherst and we try to play on each other's strengths and we strategize around supporting Amherst. So feel free to tell us what you need and we'll, we'll figure out how to implement it and how to go through. Okay, let's start. Thank you, Athena. So I'll just start with one thing and then I'm gonna pass it off to Joe. As you know, each session is two years. So we've been elected, we just were reelected. This started a new session in January of 2023. And that's about uh, the length of the legislative session, but actually legislation has less time than two years because there's recess, there's budget, et cetera. There's you know, what some people call a slow legislature. And so it really comes down to about an 18 month session. And that means from the start of introducing legislation to getting through this whole process that Joe will describe and getting across the finish line. It's about 18 months, but as you know, Every year, we have to develop a budget. And so that goes along simultaneously with legislation. Jo. And just very quickly, many of you know this uh, cycle, and it is, of course, not linear at all. Um, but it, even though we've laid it out in a line, um, this is maybe our hoped for cycle. But I just want to say that Amherst is expert here. Um, we gear up uh, to start the legislative session that happened from uh, August uh, until we got sworn in and Amherst and members of the Amherst community and certainly the town council, the school committee talked to us about the kind of priorities that you wanted us to file. Um, then we get sworn in as, as Rep Dom said, and then there's a process of co-sponsorship. We're in that right now. So if there are bills that are important to Amherst, 
um, we would like to hear about them. Also, if there are bills that are threatening to Amherst, we would like to hear from, about them. This is a very powerful time. Certainly Amherst constituents are telling us what they like and they don't like, but this is also the council. We you know, especially wanna hear from the council soon, but bills will flood into committees, uh, both the home rules that uh, Rep Dom has led on and then the other bills that perhaps Amherst is interested in. Um, and they'll get new numbers and it'll all change. And then the hearing season is upon us. Once again, hearing from Amherst at hearings is critical because you are our people, you're our loyalty, you know, you're, you're where our loyalty lies. If you say, Joe, Mindy, this bill is really important and you send in testimony or you come yourself, that's where we are much stronger because legislators understand the, these are my town, this is my town council and my town council wants this. That's language that leaders of committees really understand. Uh, and then of course there's a committee decision and then it goes through other committees and then God willing, a bill that you want would come out to the floor in both the house and the Senate. And then it has to be reconciled. So uh, again, as Rep Dom said, as Mindy said very well, even though we're here for two years, it really is compressed because of that joint rule 10, um, which is a very archaic term, which is the um, uh, first Wednesday in February of the second year. So the first Wednesday in 2024, many of these bills will have to have a, a decision. Um, not all of them, because we break our own rules um, in the legislature, uh, but many will. And that, so that's, that's the kind of race we're under right now. I just wanna also point out that this year, um, the committee hearings will be hybrid. And that means that not only residents of Western Mass, but officials in Western Massachusetts don't have to spend a whole day going to Boston to be able to submit three minutes of testimony unless you want to, um, but you will be able to participate in those hearings as will residents um, remotely, which is huge and a great benefit to Western Mass that we should capitalize on, maximize and deliver so that the legislature sees that when they do that kind of thing, when we make hearings remote, it's not just legislators saying it will encourage participation, but it results in increased participation. We can go to the next slide. So here's what the budget process looks like, and I'm going to let Joe pick this up. And I'll just say that both Rep. Dom and I, during the rules debate, which is the thing that happens first, we were very vocal in having the hybrid option for hearings um, because of what Rep. Dom just said. It was one of our priorities, both of us. So as Rep. Dom said earlier, Mindy said earlier, I think we should just do the Joe Mindy thing, I think yes? So too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, forget this reference. It's too confusing it's just, to yes, do the I can't. All right. um, uh, while we do legislation over two years, we do budgets over one. Um, and so we are in the heat of it, my friends. Uh, because the governor is new, she had until March 1st to file her budget. That is right, I think, because how the heck she could she possibly do it um, in January? But that just means that our season is compressed. So we are already in budget season. The Ways and Means Committee kicks off tomorrow um, with a the sort of the, what I call the big dog hearing in Boston, where all of the agency heads will come. And then we take it on the road, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, then the House goes first. The House always goes first in budgeting. House does money bills. And they go first. Rep. Dom, Mindy will be very active here. Um, they file amendments. They debate. They vote. And then they kick it to the Senate. And the Senate will do all of this work before Memorial Day in May. And then they'll appoint a conference committee, three and three, bipartisan, House, Senate, and and they will reconcile the budget um, by to be sent to the governor for her signature or vetoes uh, or amendments um, and have it all wrapped up by July 1. Um, now, we understand that sometimes we don't make our deadline and then we will extend government, but I do think that we should be held to account to make this deadline. Um, keep in mind that when the governor makes vetoes or amendments, um, the House and the Senate have 10 days to be able to override that. Um, and I, is that right? Or they have, and they have a certain period of time also to set those vetoes. No, the governor has governor 10, has days, 10 to... days to veto. We have to do it pretty quickly after that. So we have to be mindful that this has to pass within a certain period of time so that if we get vetoes back, we have an opportunity to override. Um, otherwise the governor's vetoes will stand. This was an issue during the governor Baker's term because he submitted overrides that 
it's often cut at the core of what the legislature was trying to do. And so we had to stay in to be able to override. Sometimes we couldn't, we had to come back at the beginning of the next session and retake up the whole bill again. But in this case, we'll see what happens. You know, it'll, it's the beginning of the dance between Governor Healy and the legislature. And I will just say that um, the last Ways and Means hearing, which I believe is April 7th, and we'll get the council all this information, that's a public hearing. So um, while some are invitation only when they're in the field, uh, the public will be able to testify. And of course, we'll be letting constituents know uh, because that's a great opportunity. And this is a that's a good opportunity. We saw that some of the comments coming from counselors were about statewide issues, in particular funding issues and how they affect the town of Amherst. Charter school reimbursement was one of those. Chapter 90 for roads was one. The This hearing is a good opportunity to say our town connected with other towns need more because that's where you'll be able to have the audience of ways and means to be able to get that conversation. And it also helps us, quite frankly, because then we're echoing the sentiments of our town, which they've just heard. from. And just to draw your attention to the fact that it all kicks off with consensus revenue, um, which is the, the first thing in the budget process. That's how much money we're gonna make. Okay. And if I could just say something on that. So this year on the consensus revenue, one of the big question marks is what are we going to, how much are we going to get from fair share and when will we be able to spend that? That has not been determined. So just keep that in mind that that pool of funds that many of us wanted to see that could be dedicated to transportation and education has not been clearly defined. Um, and so it may not be um, incorporated into the budget until it is actually. Okay, thank you, Athena. Thank you. So I just wanted to put a page up on home rules because they kind of go with a little bit of a different schedule. They don't have a schedule. Home rules can be introduced at any point during the session and bills can be too, but they expect that home rules will because they're relying on towns to take action. Um, it's good if they're filed at the beginning of the session, in my opinion, because they'll get scheduled with like-minded home rules. And that's a benefit, I think, because it shows that towns, some, especially if they're dealing with policy, it shows that there's sort of solidarity on an issue rather than a town being an outlier. So right now, Amherst has two home rules filed. The first one is HD 2929. That number will change when it gets directed to a committee. Um, and that's the one that allows for Amherst to have ranked choice voting in local elections. And HD 4164, which was the most recent one we received from the town council, which has a real estate property transfer fee for the town of for the city known as the town of Amherst. There you go. And I think um, there was a comment about a third home rule. We have not received that one yet, but we've been told to expect one um, that would allow non-citizen voting in local elections. And so once that we get um, that documentation, I'll go to house council, they'll review it, make sure the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, and then it gets filed and we'll have a number and we'll pass the number on to you. Um, the, it's good that these bills are being filed in the early part of the session because for example, the Amherst ranked choice voting one will probably be lopped in with other local communities looking for ranked choice voting, which I think is gonna be helpful. And the same thing with the real estate transfer fee will be part of a bigger discussion. Next one, Athena. So this is just our um, reminder to you that Knowing what's important to Amherst makes us better at advocating for Amherst. I know that sounds really simple and almost kind of stupid, but it's also, it's a reaffirm, reaffirmation of the invitation to keep telling us what's important to you and to the town, because that's what allows us to use that information, to insert it into conversations with our colleagues, to use it as a way to build support and ultimately to affect policies. Because not everything's going to be done on the floor of the House or the Senate, because actually very few bills comparatively get to the floor of the Senate or the House, but this is part of building awareness and support for Amherst's concerns in the building. Next one, Athena. So um, we've just been named to committees in the past two weeks, um, which is why those bills still have their baby House docket numbers because they haven't actually been forwarded to specific um, committees yet. Um, I'm happy to tell you that I was named chair of the joint committee, the house chair 
of um, the Joint Committee on Tourism, Arts and Cultural Development. And I'm extremely excited about it. I know that um, in Amherst, I know um, from our time during the beginning of COVID that tourism, arts and cultural development are essential not only to our personal development, but to our economic development. And so I'm extremely excited about seeing this intersection and how we can support and promote it in the Commonwealth. And I'm also a member of the Joint Committee on Higher Education, which I guess I don't have to really say too much about why that's important to our town. Um, but you know, being a member on that committee, and I'll let Joe give herself the honors here, but being a member on that committee is really important because it allows, um, I saw this in my first session when we dealt with the legislation on what to do if a college was needing to close. And it, because I was on the committee, I really felt like I had an opportunity to talk to the chair of that committee and influence the way that legislation was moving through the committee. This year, I'll have a different opportunity and I'll let Joe go here. <laughs> and I'll just say, uh, I'm thrilled that Mindy is the chair of this really important committee, but, and you can also expect us to work on issues that are important like arts and culture, um, even if we're not in the chair position. So when we talk about the chairs this evening, you know, we're, we're, we can't be on all committees, but you can expect us to do work on it. For example, uh, Mindy and I brought Michael Bobbitt, who's the executive director of Mass Cultural. We brought him to the region twice, you know, and that's because we know it's important for Michael to fall in love with Amherst as much as we are. Um, so where you see opportunities for us to work with state colleagues, even if we're not in their committees, um, we can do that, right? That's part of what we should be doing is bringing people west so that they can meet you um, and appreciate this work as much as we do. Okay. Oh, though this is Mindy. Sorry. Bill. Thank you, Joe. That's such. A, but it's such a good thing to underscore is that a lot of our job is talking with colleagues about the kinds of policies, programs, and assets that are important to Amherst because that ultimately makes building support for the policies you want to see passed easier. So I really thank you for doing that. So I just, I, we were asked to give a little bit of our bills. I'm just going to point out, my bills fall in these categories. You can find them on repmindydom.com or on the Massachusetts Legislator website. I would have to say that the, the three most, the three categories that um, I'm really sort of prioritizing this year are economic and food security, um, the climate and um, public health. Uh, under economic and food security, I include student hunger. And so it's on that, in that category that I'm also talking about college affordability, because the more we help with students being able to afford dinner, the more they can have resources for other kinds of things. Um, I'm happy to discuss more later, but I don't want to take up too much time with talking at. Okay, these are my committees. Um, so, uh, Mindy is a member of higher ed. I was appointed to the, be the chair, just like Mindy's the chair of arts and tourism and culture. Uh, that'll, that'll be my Senate chair position. Um, I'm also the Senate vice chair of uh, a new committee on agriculture, uh, which again, higher education and agriculture, it's not surprising that these would be both committees that are interesting to me uh, personally, but also important to our region like arts and culture. And then I was named assistant vice chair of the Senate committee on ways and means. Ways and means is a joint committee, but the Senate and the house will sort of uh, stack up their membership um, and then operate separately and together. Um, so those are, those are my chair position ships or assistant and vice chair. Um, and then I'm a member of uh, the Joint Committee on Economic Development and Emerging Technologies. Um, I really wanted to be on this committee. So I'm psyched that the Senate president appointed me. Um, I'm interested in this area. I'm interested in especially small businesses, startups. Um, I'm interested in the new ways that people are doing business. Uh, you know, the kind of closed loop green technologies. Uh, certainly I'm interested in the tie of this to climate. Um, so I'm, I'm, this is, a, I think, going to be fun, uh, this committee. Also, I asked to be appointed again to the Joint Committee on Racial Equity, Civil Rights, and Inclusion. This was a committee stood up by the legislature um, after the murder of George Floyd. It was the next session. Um, they stood up this joint committee. It, so I was a member last session, and um, I'm glad to come back. I think we can do more with this committee, and it's got good leadership. Um, 
in, it, it always does, but I, I'm excited about uh, seeing what we can do. Then I'm on the Senate Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change. This is a little confusing because you're like, what? Uh, we have the Telecommunications and Utility and Energy. That's one joint committee in ENRA, um, the Environment and Natural Resources, or it's now ENRA, or ENRA, because we took off agriculture. Um, uh, and now what about the Senate Committee? This is a you know, this is an interesting committee. Senator Cindy Cream is chairing. Um, she's quite a good chair. And it gives the Senate an opportunity to look at issues that complement the other committees. And so uh, not surprisingly, because I represent Amherst, I'm interested in things like net zero energy, um, construct net zero building um, and how it's getting implemented. You'll remember that Rep Dom and I had that bill, which we passed, uh, but you know, getting a bill passed doesn't mean anything unless you see it through. I'm also interested, of course, in methane counting and carbon accounting, things that Amherst folks are leading on. And then I'm on the Senate Committee on Rules. I was appointed to the Temporary Committee on Rules, um, which is you know, how Rep Dom and I engaged uh, Senate House on things like virtual participation in hearings. Um, and now we get to come back. I, I've never been on this committee, but it does help schedule the Senate floor. Uh, and like uh, Mindy, I have different categories of bills. They are all on Senator Joe Comerford.org. Dot org, dot com, dot org. Your dot org, your dot com. Okay. It rhymes with Mindy Dom. Mindy Dom dot com. It's funny. <laughs> um, uh, it's, but they're all there um, with with summaries like like Mindy has. But I I'll just say that I broke them out into these categories to talk with you tonight. So I you know I've I've been lucky to learn so much from towns like Amherst on what's needed municipally. So I have a transfer fee bill. Um, I know Amherst has a, a home rule in this space. Mine's uh, slightly different, but it looks at how how towns get to have a local option transfer fee um, for what we call luxury real estate. Um, and it's a great coalition behind that bill. I also have a bill to set up a municipal building authority um, that would be for municipal and public safety buildings um, and DPW buildings, the, the whole suite of them, you know, everything from towns, town halls to salt sheds to fire complexes, um, and really do it like MBLC, Mass Board of Library Commissioners, or MSBA, Mass School Building um, uh, Association Authority. Sorry. Um, and then pilot. I pay a lot of attention, like Rep Dom, like Mindy, to the payment in lieu of taxes. We're going to talk about that as work Mindy has been leading. This is about state-owned land, uh, both in terms of getting more money. And you'll see that the government governor actually, um, that's been an advocacy, something we've shared with Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll. We're very pleased with her number um, in her H1 budget. We can get it higher, I think. Um, so we're going to be there. But we also have to actually look at the formula. Right now, the formula disadvantages Western Massachusetts, um, which is, re I think, reprehensible. So that's what that bill is. And then education. I, I do have bills in the education space. Um, again, I've been made smarter by, uh, you know, Amherst and Amherst Regional School Committee around special education. Um, I foster school, foster student transportation in this space and others that the auditor, auditor, former auditor bump called out as inequities that really linger in town budgets. I also have a bill around, a couple of bills around higher education and making it more affordable and accessible. On climate, I focus a lot on PFAS. Um, there was, as you know, I think a task force on PFAS, uh, which was led by uh, leader Kate Hogan and Senator Julian Sear. Um, and so while I had a very large PFAS bill last session, rather than clutter up the space, I they, they filed it, I co-sponsored it uh, because they had the um, honor of doing the task force. Uh, but I have one on farms and farmers because PFAS and our farmers um, are, is really going to, we're on a collision course unless we do it right. So. Um, I can certainly talk about more there. We also, uh, Rep. Dom, Mindy, and I talk a lot about solar siting, which I know is a very large conversation, also land conservation. And then in healthcare, um, I, again, I won't go into details, but I focus a lot on public health and also maternal health equity. Uh, so I have, I have some, um, I was able to chair a commission on maternal health equity last session, and I have a couple of bills in the space. Um, and then, of course, not un not unsurprisingly, food security and farms. Hmm. 
So <clears throat> in terms of regional efforts, many of you know that Joe and I have been involved with both trying to make sure that we maximize state contributions for the library and for the new school project. I also want to point out that um, one of the things we did before um, advocating successfully for a change in the reimbursement rate with MSBA for schools by the foot is we were able to successfully get Amherst back on the line for MSBA. When we first got elected, I know it seems like ages ago, but it really was only four years ago, um, Amherst was not on the line at the time. We And we both promised when we ran for office that this would be our number one priority. And thrilled to do that. Kathy, can I just say publicly, thank you so much for your incredible work on this committee and advocacy. Um, I really, I feel like you have made Amherst um, a much better town and much more engaged by your temperament and your diligence. And you've made it for me as well, so thank you. Um, and so right now I'd say the currently what we're working on is we're trying to work with, you know, not only with Amherst Town Council, but with other um, reps and senators from other communities who are in this, COVID overage construction costs with their library projects um, place and trying to see if we are able to get additional related funds for all these communities who are facing these significant overages. Um, with the school MSBA, as I mentioned, we've, you know, I think we've been successful in increasing that rate. We're not stopping, you know, we're continuing to say, tell us what else you need, and then turning around and trying to make sure that we can get it. Um, Joe, would you like to tell us about the rail commission? Or is there something yeah. else you want to No, add? I just want to recognize that Amherst with the library work, the MBLC work, and Lynn, you know, you really are leading this with a lot of good folks in Amherst. Um, the kind of organizing that Amherst is doing is really actually unparalleled. Um, you know, maybe we, we're going to brag a little about you, you know, compared to other folks. So, and with Deerfield too, Deerfield is a great, good partner to Amherst, I know. Um, but we have three libraries, uh, you know, potentially at, at risk, uh, threatened. Amherst, uh, Orange, and Deerfield. And we're only gonna succeed here if we work together. Um, and all the legislators, House and Senate members feel the heat um, and the responsibility, the obligation that we feel here in Western Massachusetts. So um, if we were not stronger together, they would be able to pick us off, frankly, and we would not get funded. Um, but we are a force um, here. We're not. We're far from being done actually on the MBLC front, but we're not, we're not going to go down without a fight, um, and hopefully we'll prevail. Um, on regional rail and the rail commission, folks know, I think very well, there are four regional rail um, projects underway currently um, in Western Massachusetts. There's the North-South that went permanent, the Valley Flyer. There's the Berkshire Flyer that hooks up from New York City. Um, that's in its second year of a very successful pilot. It's almost assuredly going, that's seasonal though, but it's almost assuredly going permanent. MassDOT has started work already and is seeking both federal funds and we got a massive um, earmark, which Governor Healy said that she would release of about $250 million. Um, so that that is happening um, east-west, west-east, um, from Pittsfield through Springfield. Um, and that is exciting and it's a very ambitious um, process. Uh, and we have uh, the Northern Tier, um, North Adams into uh, Boston along the Route 2 corridor. Um, another, it's a different kind of rail project. It's not high speed, but it's also exceedingly affordable um, compared to what I think is a necessary expenditure for Springfield, you know, the Springfield line. So I think we should go for all four. Um, Mindy, Mindy and I are pretty solidly aligned here and are really talking with regional colleagues. We don't have to just settle for one line, like be grateful for the Valley Flyer and, and not advocate for anything else. No. Um, we have a, a right to be hooked up north, south, east, west, um, and to continue to fight for our fair of uh, resources. People pay a penny of your sales tax to the MBTA. Um, it's time for us to get some money back in Western Mass. So that's the Rail Commission. Um, that was another uh, joint effort of House Senate, um, where we were both very involved, getting a Rail Commission to really look at governance. So we want four or more rail authorities or rail lines moving, we need an authority to govern them, figure out about capital infra infrastructure, figure out who's going to run these things, figure out about when they run, how they connect, how the staffing happens. So that's what's happening there. Um, and that is actually, there's a hearing on March 21st 
Um, there is a rail commission hearing in Northampton. It's the one in Hampshire County. And I would just, I would, you know, come short of um, bending a knee here, but, you know, but just let me say that if, it would really be wonderful to have a formal statement from the town of Amherst, if not someone to deliver that. And you don't have to be an expert on how the heck we should govern this, but to say that this is an economic and social game changer for us, and you really want the kind of regional equity um, this is providing, um, it would be it would mean a great deal. Do you want to do solar siding? Yeah, can I? I just want to say one other thing about that. That's not. Uh, Joe and I also are strong advocates and work really hard on trying to get more funding for RTAs. So the things it's not at one or the other. It's a it's a yes and for public transportation in Western Massachusetts. The rail piece is critical because it allows for people to go across the state, and that could be either for work, for tourism, um, for you know academic purposes, et cetera. Um, people have often asked me, I think I've mentioned this to some of you, which one does Amherst prefer, the northern tier or the southern tier? And I say, whichever one goes first. That's the one that Amherst prefers. But Amherst is in this unique position because we're not a stop on any of these trains um, routes but we have lots of folks who want to use the train. We sort of bring sort of an objective view to the rail. So I can't underscore what Joe said enough about participating in the March 21st hearing um, to talk about what the town would stand to gain from a northern or southern route and additional train um, possibilities. Um, solar siting, I just, I'm going to just talk briefly about this. Joe and I are working with a group from UMass Amherst um, to develop a workshop conference that will help municipalities um, kind of figure, develop a matrix for decision making around solar siting in their municipalities. I think that's a good way. Um, and so um, we'll keep you posted on this. Amherst is certainly a town that comes to our mind when we were approached, or when we approached them and they approached us to think about doing it. And we think it's gonna be very helpful. It's not only like what are some common, what's the language that we all need to speak when we're talking about solar siting, but it's really about what are the trade-offs and which are the trade-offs that towns wanna to make or don't wanna make. So it's not telling you what those trade-offs should be, but it's a way of thinking about those trade-offs. Um, healthcare workforce pipeline, well, I'll do one piece and you'll do the other. So we each have bills that would try to put more people into this pipeline. Western Massachusetts, as many of you know, has been experiencing severe healthcare um, personnel shortages even before COVID, during COVID even more so. And now as we're um, still in it, but coming out of it a little bit, really experiencing this tightly. And so the bill that I have is one that looks at what a, um, a commission that was working at, at was examining foreign trained um, physicians and how to facilitate their work in the United Massachusetts without having to go back specifically to do a whole medical residency. Um, the bill basically creates a pathway for that. And I'm really proud of this bill because I think it's important for our neighbors to be able to have the opportunity to share their talents. It's good for patients to be able to access um, to physicians of all kinds, but also culturally um, competent physicians at the same time. And I'm thrilled that the Center for New Americans, um, that Lori Millman, the executive director, participated in the original commission that then became the model. And so did Joe. No, no, yes. Go. Let's, for time, for time, let's, we can move on, I think. But I agree with you, Mindy. This is very exciting. So this is just what we provide, what we bring back. So we have local earmarks or investments. I'm going to say this because you won't take credit for it. No, stop. Um, so Joe um, was no, very stop. instrumental in developing the equitable approaches to public safety program in Massachusetts and bringing home funds that, that launched the Crest program. The Food Security Infrastructure Grant Program benefits folks in Amherst. The Mass Cultural Council last this year is about a half a million dollars to Amherst individuals and organizations. Small business grants, I really wanna point this out. I don't want there to be any confusion. During COVID, the Amherst Chamber of Commerce and the bid helped to bring over $2 million in small business grants to this town. Um, it's a fact. We can provide you with the data if you need it. Um, they did that in a variety of ways. That was state money that they brought in and that doesn't include the close to $350,000 that the Downtown Amherst Foundation raised through like a GoFundMe and then provided to small businesses as well. Um, and those grants hopefully will continue to see 
um, small business grants come into um, the town of Amherst. We have public health funding, Joe, maybe you might want to talk about that and the pilot increases um, Joe mentioned. And also Amherst is in a few bonds, um, specifically around affordable housing and climate resiliency and information and some cultural organization ones. And with a new governor, this may present a new opportunity to trigger those bonds. That was, thank you. Um, and I just want to say that when you look at these, I think what you should think about Mindy and I is that we can and are approached for individual earmarks as legislators, um, but we can and are approached also um, for, can be and are approached for line items, specific line items that are important not only to the town, but the people in the town. Um, and so that's that's what this is sort of meaning to be here is that we're we're active and sometimes it doesn't look like oh this is a grant to Amherst, but it is a grant that we might think would benefit say for example a farm in Amherst or a cultural center in Amherst. And so when you're thinking about the totality of money that we keep our eye on and fight for, you can think big, um, because. Whereas earmarks are, you know, a little bit one off and on the smaller side, sometimes grant funding is not. Um, and just and here's a great uh, example of advocacy. Paul, um, town manager, um, noticed that the equitable approaches to public safety was not funded in Governor Healy's budget. You, Amherst has gotten two of those grants. They're called EAPS. It's an unfortunate name or an unfortunate acronym. Um, and for some reason, I don't know why the governor chose not to fund it, um, but it's zeroed out. Um, so when, uh, you know, it, when Paul emailed, I was able to say, yeah, I saw it. It's not in there. And it's, of course, it's on our budget sheet um, for our meetings because it is consequential to Amherst, to the Crest program here. And so, you know, that's the kind of, that's the, that's what we're, we're looking for. So you can talk to us about all of it, you know, solar grants. You can talk to us about public health money. You can talk to us about traditional chapter 70, chapter 90 money, all of which comes back to Amherst. Okay. I think we answered this and I really, I'm not sure we want to take more time with us just talking at you, but I guess, um, so we talked about home rule petitions. I'm going to go up the, up the chain. Open meeting law. This was a concern that we, um, we heard that some counselors had, as you know, um, the open meeting law and being able to do hybrid has been extended till March uh, 2025. And the Senate will do that. Yeah, and I think there are there are some bills that are cooking around in the House that would require it. We're aware of how Amherst feels about the requirement and also how we feel about the requirement without um, additional resources for towns to be able to tap into. Um, and so we'll be advocating and also bringing you into that discussion because this is going to be one of those bills. It's going to be critical for towns to come to, to speak during the public hearing about what is the impact of the proposed legislation and how could it be changed to be better. This is really going to be critical. Um, the, I'm just going to jump around. You can talk about the governor's budget hearing. Okay. Um, the affordable housing and zoning. Um, we're continuing to, you know, we're waiting to see, like, you know, the governor's produced her bill, but she's also named a special secretary of housing. How do those things come together and how can we better support Amherst? Again, please let us know. Pilot proposals, we are looking at legislation. We're waiting for data from the town to make sure that that legislation accounts for the, the uniqueness of Amherst situation. Um, but we are looking at legislation that not only is Joe's legislation, also legislation to look at how does the formula need to be tweaked, but maybe a new way of looking at pilot. Do you want to about the governor's budget? Yeah, in the governor's budget, we talked a little bit about this. So Ways and Means will hold these regional hearings on uh, select topics. So on March 13th, we will be at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, Amherst, it's an invitation only hearing, um, which is the way that Ways and Means does these, um, but we Amherst has ex gotten an invitation um, to speak. And so I think the town is figuring out who is going to represent the town. I'm hoping for, uh, it's, on, it's on both education and local aid. Uh, so um, I'd like Amherst to sort of straddle both of those uh, and speak a little bit to both um, the education uh, funding formulas in the budget and, um, and you can speak of course to early ed to higher ed. Um, and then also local aid. Uh, so that's March 13th, and we're working out all those details now. 
I think that's it in our contact information. Right, and we, the town has these. And so this is how to find us. But of course, you, I, hopefully you feel like you can find us easily. Um, and we should be available for you. We actually work for you. <laughs> so we should be available all the time. And for the public watching and for counselors or anybody else, uh, that presentation is in our folder. So all of those contact and um, social media uh, locations are also known. So with that, I want to open the floor for uh, counselors. And I do see already one counselor having their hand up. And that is, um, Athena, you had your hand up first. I wanted to just check if you needed to. I'm just making a quick note that Councillor Miller has left the meeting. So if I'm trying to okay. reach out and see if she's rejoining, I'll let you know if she does. Uh, I, believe I believe she is uh, left the meeting for the evening. Okay. Um, thank you. Dorothy Pam. Uh, just a quick question. Um, any progress on the death with dignity bill? Thank you so much for that question. I, I have filed it again with great uh, House support. And of course, Mindy is a great supporter. Um, leader Jim O'Day and Rep um, Ted Phillips are the House leads, and I have it with Senator Brownsberger and Senator Moran. It will go to committee like the other 6,300 bills. Um, you know, however many were filed, we'll get that number soon. It'll probably go to the Public Health Committee, and I am hopeful. Um, that they will give it an early hearing. I've asked for an early hearing, which is something that you can always ask us to ask. Get it, get it heard early so that it can get decided early and have time to live on the other side of it. Okay. Well, I'm you. hopeful. I'm very hopeful for this session. Thank you. Uh, Kathy. Thank you for the tour de for force that you the, the dynamic duo just did for us. Um, I have a question on how broad the March 13th on education is, but just on some other big topics. And I sent some of these in in advance, but the charter formula um, particularly hits us hard. And I got from the schools uh, over the weekend that it's um, an over a $3 million net drain. And I forwarded that to Lynn. Mm -hmm. So I know when you ran, you were talking about trying to fix it, you know, whatever the fix is, but it's pulling resources directly out of our schools. Um, so it goes with my second question is when I think many of us voted for a fair share, we thought the word education included K through 12. Um, and what the governor came out with didn't seem to, or didn't seem to do very much. And then the other side of her budget didn't say, but we're going to put a lot of money into chapter 70. So again, I'm just focusing on education first. And there are a couple other, they're not small, but they're smaller. So trying to think of where in the budget money could flow more quickly, where you don't have to completely change legislation, but you could change how existing things work. So education. Then on fair share, my second question is the other side of it is transportation, I thought might mean roads as well as mass transit. And when you get out to our part of the world, we're in a less competitive situation when we go out to get our roads done and the cost of tar has gone up. So each dollar buys less road. So enhancing it either through fair share or the other way is just chapter 90. I mean, anything on that, it's it's so visible for people who are taxpayers on where where's their tax dollar going. So I'll just stop. And my last, I've already talked to you on solar, just um, somewhere along the line, instead of having excess money at the end of the year, which happened last year, but thinking, can there be solar money that says if a public entity is willing to go to net zero, we'll help you buy the solar, whether it's put it on your affordable housing, whether it's put it on your fire station, your police station, or your school, but just something that not just says climate change, but says climate change, and we're going to help you do it. Uh, I'm going to take a first couple ones, Kathy. I'm going to really suggest that whoever's going to speak for Amherst at that hearing, talk about um, the reason why funding, refund, redoing the charter school formula and, and making sure that towns don't lose money gets addressed. 
I think this is a great opportunity because there's gonna be people from the Eastern part of the state who have a different orientation towards charter schools and charter school funding to hear about what the impact is on a town and what we're expecting. I also think it's a fair opportunity to say, when you get around to thinking about what to do with the fair share money, here's what Amherst would like you to do with it. And then identify charter school reimbursement, chapter 90, um, and making sure that roads are inc included in transportation. Remember, they haven't quite yet figured out not just how much is being generated, but the formula to use to be able to start divvying it up. So use that hearing in our backyard as an opportunity to say, here's what we would like you to use that money for. And I would really, on the charter schools, I think it's critically important to talk about not just how much money is coming out of the district, but how much the district is down right now in terms of, and what it's looking at in terms of having to make cuts, because that's a real scale kind of moment, you know what I'm saying? Okay. And I would say that the governor uh, put out a fair share blueprint with her budget. So you can see the kinds of programs that she apportioned um, some of the initial go at fair share. Again, it's very much in development. And I think everybody knows that this is, you know, her budget is important. It's a marker, but the house is about to do something that is not more consequential, but certainly more lasting because the house will do its budget and then the Senate will do its budget and the House and Senate budgets are going to be the ones that get haggled over. Um, so that's Im that's important. It's, you know, it's a it's a trio um, and, and the governor set a marker um, on Chapter 90. The formula is is re really um, completely unworkable for communities with more roads. That's that's a more road mileage, right? Chapter 90 works if you're a dense little city with not a lot of roads, road miles to maintain. That's why we did the winter road program um, last session. Amherst benefited from that because it was miles. It calculated by miles, not by per capita. Um, and so that's, of course, per capita is nuts for us out here. And so we need to continue to push for chapter 90 reform, either reform chapter 90 or really fund something, I don't think we should call it the Winter Roads Program, but it, it, it was the, the name that we gave it last session and did the mileage versus population. So we can do, we did that once, we can do it permanently. Um, and I'll just agree with uh, Mindy, I, you know, I think Amherst can say a lot about the effect of charter, both in terms of um, the formula change that's necessary, but also funding the charter mitigation line. Right, but there's other line items. There's regional school transportation. Um, there's special education funding. There's the circuit breaker. Um, there are numbers of different ed, ed lines that are very consequential for Amherst that that I think Amherst can talk about. And with also, you know, in that context of a rural school with low-ish or declining enrollment in some cases, right? That's the that's the rural line that is in the budget. Governor Healy, to her credit, put more into that, right? That used to be a slog um, in the legislature. She got us going um, and cheers for her. I think we can do better. Um, and, you know, we can talk about what the consequence of that would be for Amherst. Is that a fix for the rural school issue that's before us? No, absolutely. And that's a conversation that Rep. Dom and I will have with Rep. Lay and others who have been leading this. But think of that hearing as an opportunity to spell out what Amherst needs um, and why. Because I don't assume that the folks who are going to be there, with the exception of our senator, is going to understand the context of how these issues play out out here. This is why this is such a great opportunity that it's happening in Western Mass. Okay. Um, Andy. First of all, thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, of course, I'm always the one who's talking about fiscal issues, and uh, I uh, I know that uh, two two of our uh, representatives from the Mass Municipal Association are going to be out here um, for the hearing on Friday, and uh, I have the um, I have the privilege of serving on the fiscal policy committee, and uh, they um, really did um, ask the committee a lot of questions, and I think that. Uh, their testimony will also represent um, not just this community, but um, I think all communities and what we're facing. So I'll just touch on two things really quickly. Uh, one is uh, we've been really hit hard, as has everybody else, by recent inflation. 
inflation affects everything that we do. And uh, so developing a budget for inflation is going to be really, uh, that is going to meet the needs of inflation is going to be really hard. And uh, I very much appreciate the fact that this is a very tough year with the 1.6% increase in the uh, consensus budget projection for revenue. And uh, I know that the governor proposed a uh, unrestricted government aid number that's higher than 1.6%, but not much higher, and certainly doesn't come close to inflation when you put when it's 2%. Two, 2 and um, for us, it's going to be, and I think for all municipalities, because I heard it universally from every community that reported during the um, uh, MMA uh, fiscal policy meeting that uh, the the uh, two percent is under inflation and represents um, substantial uh, problem in trying to just maintain the core services that uh, this community and all communities provide. And uh, for uh, many schools, uh, we support the Student Opportunity Act, uh, but uh, in there needs to be some balance between the high need schools who are identified in the Student Opportunity Act and the rest of us. Because um, when you get $30 a student, which is what the governor proposed for pupil, um, for us, it, it comes out to a half of a percent uh, increase. And uh, so for, you know, we're in a real uh, hard time. And the last thing I want to say, so I don't take up any more time, is that uh, our voters in Amherst were big supporters of the Fair Share Amendment. We had a very high positive vote. And I am concerned that uh, the Fair Share Amendment, when the decisions are made about what the transportation needs are and what the education needs are, that um, to remember that um, our um, K-12 schools and our transportation needs, which are heavily in roads, is a big part of what's needed. So, but thank you for, very, for what you're doing. And I'm sure that those uh, sentiments are going to be expressed both by the MMA and um, by our own witnesses uh, Friday. So something just to keep in mind, um is that in the budget, in the, again, the brief proposal on fair share, they're setting up things like, you know, an RTA pilot fund for micro transit. Um, that'll benefit, that's that they have us in mind. Um, they're also gonna put money, real money into um, Western Mass Rail. Again, that they have us in mind with those two transportation um, lines. And I, you know, I hear, we hear a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot about fair share. Um, and making sure that we get our fair share of fair share, um, because we did a lot for it, right? Western Mass really put it over the line. And I just want to say, and I, we've said this in different groupings, that's that's our job, right? Our job is to get a fair shake of the $55.5 billion blueprint. Maybe it'll be a little more after the House, a little more after the Senate, we don't know. Um, but that's that really is our job. So it's not just fair share. Fair share is a tiny little piece of this sea of money. And I think it's really important for us to focus on that larger um, pie as we go for, if we, as we make sure that we get a, you know, a fair shake at, um, at the other kind of new money coming in. And some of that new money is coming into higher ed. Um, and I, I agree with you completely, completely that chapter 70 doesn't work for Amherst the way it is right now. And, and, and it is, you know, abysmal, and we do at Northampton's in the a very similar boat, and Hadley, like some of these, the sort of um, smaller middle income communities, and it is something that we have to do. Hold harmless is not working, um, and that is completely true. Um, but I just want you to know that it's like we are like hawks on this money um, because it is our job to make sure it comes home. Not that we can't do it without you, um, and entities like the MMA. I also, first of all, Andy, thank you so much for your service with the MMA, because you really are so valuable to me when you're in meetings, being able to kind of share what's going on from the MMA's perspective in terms of the state. I also want to point out that next Tuesday, I think, is the Chapter 90 hearing, actually, in the legislature. Um, and it's an, a 
appropriate time if people wanted to put pen to paper to email concerns about making sure that roads in Western Massachusetts are viewed as a priority area. Believe me, we will take this, I'm taking this in, and I will be speaking about it as much as possible, um, but it's not a bad idea to put it on the record that we wanna make sure that chapter 90 kind of views roads in Western Massachusetts as a high priority. Right, and bridges and small culverts, all of these things are unique, more unique to us than Eastern Mass, for sure. Um, By the way, who knew what a culvert was? I mean, I really didn't, but now I feel like I'm married to culverts. <laughs> really, I mean, who knew? The things you learn as a legislator. You now it's, it's all I want to talk to anybody. <laughs> what about that culvert? Kind, kind of like town council, we learn every day. Uh, Mandy Joe. Yeah, um, I won't take up too much more of your time because my comments echo both Kathy and Andy's comments. Um, the, but the governor's blueprint on the fair share amendment spending is very concerning. Um, it spends a of $490 million in transportation. She proposes 181 just for the MBTA, yet only 25 for those regionals, which is not just our PVTA. That's the Worcester one. That's the Cape one. That's, you know, there's not a lot of, road funding in there at all for Western Mass. Um, so I hope you'll uh, consider um, not, and, and that's just the transportation side of that. That's just half of half the side. The ed side, I was shocked to see there's almost no K-12 spending, especially when over the last decade and more, we have seen the state's share of the spending at the K-12 level of our budgets dramatically drop. Um, we continue to raise our contributions to the education funds in our town um, and our regional district year after year after year, and we're making up for a lack of statewide investments in our schools where the I, Peter's here he could probably tell us the exact percentage but we're just in the last five years we've gone from an estimated 33% at the region being state funded to 31%. That's only in five years. I think the decline has been even more dramatic if you go back 10 years or 15 years. And we really need to see that K-12 spending. Higher ed spending is great, except when it doesn't reflect the pilots that we need because of UMass's effect on this town. Um, so without a pilot, um, a fix to the pilot formula that really reflects a rural community like ours that gets an extra 20 to 40,000 people into it every day to work um, because of a state institution, it's, it, that, that investment needs to be there too. Okay. Um, I just wanna say, I hear you. Uh, I, I hear you completely. And remember that is, that's her blueprint that's not the House's blueprint, and it's not the Senate's blueprint, but I agree with you. The MBTA continued investment in that travesty um, is, you know, it's enraging um, when we think of the things that we don't have out here, like night and weekend service and enough stops and enough routes and enough frequency. I totally get it. We also don't know what- And schools. We don't know what the relationship's going to be between um, the fair share amendment and regular funding. Right, fair share amendment is over and above the regular funding. So does this mean that she's anticipating that everything else would be completely funded by the budget and that this is extra? And how will the House and Senate view that? So we'll see. Um, it, that information will start to um, sort of come to the, it'll start to emerge from the legislature, I think in the next month after these hearings that are happening. Um, I also wanna make note that Mandy Jo is on an MMA policy committee and uh, Paul Bockelman is on the MMA, I'm sorry? Public Works, Committee. Public Works Committee. So you got a couple eyes and ears from MMA. Yeah, and we encourage MMA to bring it. Um, yeah. No joke in this, right? This is part, the government only works when people make it work. Right. Um, and Boston needs to feel the the collective interest of Mass Municipal Association on this budget. This is a consequential budget. It's it's our governor's first. She's a wonderful governor and great lieutenant governor, but we have to make sure that she really feels us out here. Absolutely. Um, Anika? I know you've been thanked already, but I have to thank you again earlier. Uh, this presentation was great. Um, 
I really appreciate your energy. I will probably never mumble again about members of committees. And <laughs> congratulations <laughs> to, you, <laughs> to you both. Thank you. Um, I just, well, I, I really wouldn't know where to start, so I'm not going to take up too much time, but I really want to uh, just thank you both for really um, energizing me and really pointing out that this really is um, a relay race, you know, us, us working together. And I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you just for recognizing really just the, the challenges of, you know, COVID recovery and its devastation on um, mo most everything, but especially, you know, with challenges for economic development and recovery and recognizing the bid and the chamber. Um, I'm so really excited about the the railroad. I, that I just think about that's just such a gift of what it would all, not just give, uh, to the community, but also what we would gain from it as well. It's like a the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and yes, yeah, there, there's so much else and my questions were covered, but I'm sure I will have many more and send them to you. So this was fantastic. And I hope that this is a regular thing. What do you hear? Great. Thank you, Anika. I hope so too. Thanks. Uh, Anna? Echoing the chorus. Thank you both so much. Um, I, I don't say that to be flippant. I think you should hear all of the gratitudes that that you deserve. So thank you, truly. Um, I have a couple of questions about advocacy and, and how to best advocate. As you know, uh, we as a council, in order to advocate on a particular issue as representing the council, need to have voted on a letter or something like that. Um, I've been sort of tracking the uh, what's going on in the legislature. And I know that there was recently a vote to um, an attempt to expand the notification window for hearings and that did not pass. And so I believe it's it's a relatively short amount of time. Um, to be clear, the expansion wouldn't necessarily have helped us either, but uh, because we don't meet every week, how is the best way to stay appraised of what hearings you think would be particularly helpful? I'll note um, to my colleagues, I've got it in my calendar to start drafting a letter about trains. So uh, we'll, we'll get that one in, but, um, yeah, what's the best way in terms of making sure that we know which which hearings you want us to prior or you believe would be a priority in addition to us determining which ones we believe would be a priority. And then similarly on issues that don't necessarily have a hearing yet, is there a way that we as a council should be um, advocating beyond just to you as our legislators? Can I jump in? Um, so thank you so much, Anna, for that question. Um, you know, the Mass Legislature has a website, malegislature.gov that has all the bills, and then you can track individual bills. Um, I would recommend that you not wait to see when certain bills get scheduled because of your schedule. And if you want to participate, start drafting those statements. And then as the hearings come up, you'll be able to submit testimony or present testimony, depending on availability. So for example, if I just went by the home rules, I'd say that first of all, definitely start drafting testimony on the two home rules that Amherst has submitted. But you may want to also submit testimony on behalf of like Joe's bill, which is the enabling bill for um, housing transfer fees for the whole state. Because if that bill went through, we wouldn't need necessarily home rules. Is that correct? Yeah. So, you know, you kind of want to work on both levels. The same thing with ranked choice voting. Um, well, I think there is enabling legislation for ranked choice voting in all local elections, and we can get you that information. But based, and also, the, the pilot legislation, start developing it. And the best way to do, uh, Joe and I have talked to people about this for testimony is not just to say what bill it is and what, and that you support it, but tell the legislature why. Why is it important to Amherst? What is the problem that the legislation is trying to solve that Amherst experiences? Why do you think this is the remedy? And then if you think it needs to be tweaked, put in your suggestions for improvement. Legislation is a conversation. And I don't know any legislator, well, I do know some, but they're not, whatever, that thinks that when they submit legislation, word for word, that's what they want to get out. Anybody's, we're all going to be happy if things just move in the right direction. So if you have an opportunity to improve, make the suggestion. The other thing I'm going to say is if you're, if you're going to speak in person or submit it in writing, send a copy to Joe and I, because we can also take that copy and send it to the chair just to make sure they saw it or to use it in our conversations with committee members, including ways and means, if it ends up there to get it out. So it gives us a little bit more fuel to our advocacy. Um, 
but I think we, we got some of the areas of concern, but you should feel free to send us more and then we'll send you bill numbers. You can track it yourself, but I wouldn't wait for the hearing to get scheduled if there's a bill that you're concerned about. Thank you, that's very helpful. And I would also say that Amherst has committees right that are tracking that are that have priorities right planning climate you know people churning on that they'll have bill numbers so will the mma the mma has policy priorities that amherst could consider um so there are there are a range of things and of course the budget process happens on the same timeline every year um and that has both numbers and it has outside sections right policy possibilities but i love the question okay Shalini. Yes, thank you again. And uh, I think uh, this is also for the public to know that, you know, it's so great to have representatives who are so accessible. And I've always felt so supported in asking any and all questions and in my initiatives. So thank you. And um, my question was about housing. I mean, all the others have been addressed, but as you may have heard, uh, there's a shortage of housing and nationally um, and statewide. Specifically, I was talking about thinking about workforce housing because we've done a lot for affordable housing. And in New Hampshire, there was a workforce housing law that was passed in 2011. And I wonder if uh, anything is happening here in Massachusetts that would specifically address workforce housing. I think that, I think there are lots of bills that have been filed around this issue. Um, many of them actually have come from legislators, I think, who were in the Northeast for some reason, like the Lawrence Mary Mac Valley area. I think um, a, a great young rep whose name is Andy Vargas, um, who I work with a lot, has quite a few bills. But if you want us to look up and specifically see what those bills are and pass them back to you for you to consider as a body, I'm happy to do that. So that could be one way that we could be helpful to you is we could identify what are the bills currently in there. Now, I'm not sure... Um, you know, there's going to be a new secretary of housing. So where that person prioritizes workforce housing, which I think is probably going to be pretty high. Um, and then what that means in terms of what the administration is going to want to support, that could change the calculus for what happens to bills. So there will be, so I, sh I want, um, you may already know this, there will be a housing bond this year in this session. And that's an enormous opportunity especially when we have a governor who says that they're committed to doing housing, to get local, not only big picture, but also local picture. So like um, if there was a particular project that Amherst wanted that was housing related, this might be a perfect bond vehicle to be able to look at that because it's going to be a housing bond and we have a governor who's supportive, who wants to be spending money on housing. Um, I think that's... Did you want to say something? Yeah, I'll just say that the really, the, I love that you brought this up. And uh, in addition to what Mindy said, um, the good thing that's happening here is that Amherst is, it, and as you know, is part of two very large bodies now that have been formed, one formed recently, one ongoing, right? The Western Mass Network to End Homelessness. Um, and then uh, Keith Ferry of um, Wayfinders has formed a housing production group. This is excellent. He is excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so he's identified through Donahue a 13,000 unit gap um, that we're going to face in just a couple of years of units in up and down the valley, um, including Amherst, but not exclusively to Amherst. And I do think that we have to get stealth like nobody's business, right? And really think, what are the number of units under production right now? We know that thanks to Keith's efforts up and down the valley. And what's the delta? The delta is considerable. And then how do we move it out here? And so I'm I'm hopeful, I'm more hopeful than I have ever been that out in Western Massachusetts, we have a watchdog group unifying the builders and the developers and really pushing us toward a numeric empirical goal. Um, it is sobering, right? Because we're so, so far. Um, from where we need to be, but I really just want to celebrate Keith's leadership and and Wayfinders and all the developers, certainly here. You know, the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust has been a massive mover in both of those spaces. So, um, I, you know, I, we can't let up. I was going to say, I also want to celebrate Amherst. I mean, Amherst has taken on um, some, you know, several incredible projects in the past four years 
that I think are going to yield 100 new units within a couple of years. So, you know, lots of towns don't do that. They want, they see that housing is a problem, but they don't pursue it and they don't cultivate it and they don't um, endow their local municipal committees with the ability to make those calls and move that in that direction. And all the credit to the Affordable Housing Trust, yeah. but also to the town for doing it. Are there any other comments from counselors? So let me just say, I think we hit all the buttons. Um, and we just want to thank you. You've now given us an hour and a half of your time or more, Jeez. plus everything else Where's you do. <laughs> um, and uh, my one last parting comment is rail is great, but we need roads to get there. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's just a little additional side there, Anna. We'll see. My letter is about trains, but we'll okay. see. Okay. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm grateful for my thank colleagues you. expressing the many, many things that are on their minds, and we hear about them and talk to you regularly about them. So. Paul, did you have anything you wanted to add? You sure? Okay. Thank you so much for Thank your you. service and for giving us this opportunity. Very That's great. Us again. Don't make it. Athena, did you want to add anything else? I just wanted to ask Mindy and Joe if you'd like to turn around at the camera on the wall and say hello to the people on Zoom because they've been looking at the back of your heads. <laughs> Hi, <everybody>. Thank you. <laughs> it, Please forgive my back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before we move to take a break, uh, when we return, the order of business will be as follows. We're going to do a general public comment, but it's during that general public comment that those people who would like to speak to um, the um, agenda item 8. Point, or 8.A point or 8A, uh, that we will have a special public comment during that time. So we're going to take a break, uh, 10 minutes. We'll be back here at 8.20. And um, then we'll proceed with general public comment. Please turn off your video and your mic. And when you return, please turn your video back on. Thank you.
You have less than two minutes to get back to your seats and get going. As you return to your seat and uh, please turn your video on so that I know you're here. Oh, sorry. Can we have public comment? All right. Uh, we have two public comment periods. This is a different than many of our meetings. One of them is general public comment, and the other will be specific public comment after we introduce the proposed changes to our rules of procedure. So my first request is going to be, if you are either in the room, and we do have one person in the room with us, um, make sure you have registered with the clerk of the council. And if you're in the audience and you would like to make public comment, general public comment, please raise your hand. So we have one person in the room and two people on general public comment on Zoom. Are there any other people on Zoom who want to make general public comment? All right, Athena, how would you like to proceed? Peter Demling, do you want to come up and- Okay, um, you could just our first public comment is coming up. Please make sure the mic is on, state your name, where you live and proceed. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm have Peter Demling. three Demling. minutes, that's all. All three minutes, good. Okay. Hi, uh, Peter Demling, 20 Hour Circle. I'm also a member of the Emmer School Committee and the Emmer's Pelham Regional School Committee, speaking for myself tonight and not on behalf of uh, my committees. Um, but as a as an amazing dynamic duo to follow, I could just plus one the uh, shout out to Kathy Shane, who's been amazing on the building project. Um, but what I'm here to talk about tonight is a request um, to the town council for me uh, to please be clearer, more direct, and more frequent in explaining to the public the constraints that you're currently facing in funding next year's budget. And the reason I ask is that it feels like the school committee has been doing a lot more explaining of the town's funding constraints for next year than we have either the capacity or the expertise to handle. And I, I feel like we need help. We are honestly having a hard time explaining this to the public and getting the message across. Um, so right now we are projected to cut a combined uh, $2 million from level services, including 30 lost staff positions for next year. And the kind of question we get on school committee when we present this is, well, we have high property taxes already and Amherst says it values public schools. So, so what are we doing here? Um, and to answer, school committee can begin to explain that this is because our school's level services have increased by more than 6% from last year because of inflation and a variety of other factors and that there are not undiscovered millions hiding in our budget especially after we've cut more than four million from level services in the last six years but why can the town of amherst only give two and a half percent or or, or three percent as, um, as it may be um so in school committee we've been trying to explain that this is because the two and a half percent limit on the increased property taxes that you face the $25 per thousand dollar limit on property taxes that you face, the lack of pilot funding that we just heard a little bit about, um, the reserves that you need to hold back to fund multiple deferred 
core infrastructure projects, the limited space there is in town for new business tax growth, and so on. Um, but this is hard for us in, in having, and you're having the power to set this amount and in owning this decision of how much money we do get, this council knows better than we do and is therefore in a better position to explain this to the public. So to have no staff cuts and to give our unions what they're asking for right now would require an additional $4 million above the 2.5% guidance that you've provided. $4 million. You know that's impossible that a budget is a pie and not an infinite well. Uh, and you know the reasons why. This is a, a difficult conversation to be having with the public, uh, to, to, to present and to be discussing what to do about deep cuts in our school services. It's, it's not easy. And so I would just ask you to please help us in explaining the town's fiscal constraints to the public so that we can all arrive at the best solution as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for your public comment and for joining us in the room. Um, we have two other people. Carol Gray, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. You have three minutes. Yes, hi, thank you for your time. Uh, Carol Gray, 815 Southeast Street. I, I would like to tag on to what Mr. Denling just said about uh, the schools. And uh, I think that a town makes sets its priorities about budget. And I think that the teachers now on work to rule absolutely deserve the, the raises. If, if you have 3% in, uh, in a time period when inflation rate has been far above that, in fact, it's a pay cut, it's not even a raise. So, but, but we should look at it in the broader context. We're talking about a proposed library project that is now $50 million and, if it's four million a year to give the teachers what they're what they deserve, well, you divide that by fifty million, we could get quite a number of years of adequately paying our teachers. I, it's not that there is no money. It's how is the town going to allocate the money that we have, and what kind of choices are we going to make? Are we going to invest in teachers, uh, or, and that's just one of many capital projects. Uh, there's the new schools, you know, perhaps there should be a, a public ranking of what capital projects and what priorities uh, the town believes in. Perhaps people would rather spend uh, money on increasing salaries for teachers and building new schools instead of a $50 million library. Um, I also wanted to weigh in because I'm not sure if I'm going to be here for the later public comment. I think public comments should be at the beginning of meetings. Uh, I, I thought that I'd get to speak at 6.30, but I waited two hours. And the idea that you want to cut public comment, I find very troubling. We went from a form of governance that had 240 voices in the room to one that has 13 voices in the room to then say that we don't have time to listen to the members of the public who come to these meetings and wanna speak for three minutes because something's very important to them, I think is really egregious and not the direction we should go in. So I think that you should allow uh, public comment and, and usually it's probably fairly short in time, but the times when it needs to go longer, like the one time when there was that issue about race that just got abruptly cut short and caused a lot of friction in our town, that wasn't appropriate. It, people need to be listened to. And there, the, there should be a three minute time limit, just like there used to be in town meeting, like there is now, and it should not be cut short. And I, I know that you all work very hard and you work very long hours, but cutting the public's right to speak is not where you should cut. And you should have the courtesy to put public comment first. Don't make people wait two hours. Don't make them wait until the end of the meeting. They have a right to be heard in the beginning, which is what used to happen with the select board. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Allegra Clark, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Allegra Clark. I am a resident of District 2, and I would like to speak briefly tonight about the schools. Um, I'm a parent of a Wildwood kindergartner. Um, all things going as planned, I will be a parent of a kindergartner at the new school if it gets built. Um, and I'm a graduate of Amherst Regional High School. And I just, 
I, I appreciate that Mr. Demling came and asked for more clarity for the public. I think that that is important, but I also just, I am a little bit confused because the December and November financial indicators, it appeared that everything was rosy in, in some of the presentations that were given and to, to go from, we think we have level service funding to we are cutting 30 staff positions is, I'm, I'm just a little bit baffled. Um, and if 4 million is the number that we need, that number I hope we can find. I know that um, Allison McDonald had put out um, information that about $354,000 might be made available through some state aid. Um, and I would like for at least that money to go towards the schools, perhaps to help with some of the cuts. Um, I'm very concerned that paraeducators are gonna be cut, especially in the libraries and the elementary schools that will cut the ability for our librarians to have support services around some of the special programming that they bring in, such as um, just this past Thursday was Read Across America Day and UMass athletes from various teams came and read to all the students in, in all the classrooms in Wildwood. Um, and I'm sorry, it's just my, my son loves the library. It's his favorite specials class. When I tell him that Wednesdays are early release days, he gets so mad because he doesn't get to go to the library and have his library class. And to think that some of the support services around providing books to our students, providing books to our teachers and allowing for the freedom of knowledge to flow throughout the school, um, the support for those programs is gonna be cut. It's just infuriating to me when we're talking about building a hundred million dollar new school, which I think is important and I hope happens. I, I don't want this council to think that I'm not in support of that or I'm saying we can only have one or the other, but if we don't have the, the staff and the teachers to staff a new building, we're just gonna have a shiny, empty, beautiful school and, and how are we going to have learning there if we don't have teachers who feel respected and students who understand that their teachers are supported by this community? And that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. So that concludes the general public comment. And let me uh, then say that we are going to move on to our action item. The first one, in fact, is the proposed amendments to the town council rules of procedure. Um, the, I'm, we are going to ask the town clerk to put those up on the screen and um, note that one of them is actually in rule 3.2 and the others are in rule five. Um, GOL had a uh, conversation about this just this past week. And so I'm going to call on Pat DeAngelis, who is chair of GOL, uh, to uh, give a general report of that committee. We're gonna start with looking at 3.2, which is regular council meetings. We're suggesting uh, replacing Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I can do it. This will be a choppy report. I apologize. Anyway, we're looking at 3.2, uh, we had a discussion uh, that uh, we perhaps should try to end meetings at 10 o'clock and take a roll call vote. Um, with a, And if a majority of counselors wanted to adjourn the meeting, we could do that. So there was quite a bit of discussion about that. Um, but uh, it was deemed 3.2 itself was deemed unnecessary. We work until the work is done. Um, and uh, having a goal that we never can meet <laughs> seemed um, not really important. Um, we did we did quite a bit of work on other sections of ROP, but let's look at rule five, uh, five public participation. Um, and basically we're talking about um, section, uh, a request to amend 
6.1 by adding a new section, which would limit the length of public comment to 30 minute, minutes, and then moving the agenda forward to address action items. Um, discussion went on about that, and it came, it, a motion was formed uh, to limit the initial public comment to 30 minutes, move to action items, and then come back. Um, and that's been very controversial for many good reasons, which is why I chose to pull it from the um, consent agenda. Um, so that was, and that's and that's really where I think we are tonight, and that's what we need to focus on. Um, you know, some of the other sections are pretty direct and uh, just have to do with uh, uh, changing a line or adding a, uh, an expression uh, like in 5.2, we're talking about adding by majority vote of the council regarding public hearings. That's kind of a no brainer like 3.2. So I'm going to stop there um, and say that we need as council to have a discussion and then we need to open it to public comment. Okay. So the floor is open for the council at this point, and then we'll move to public comment. Pam? Thank you. Um, so the question is, the expectation tonight is that we will talk about it, and then GOL takes this back home with them and works on it. Right. So let me just explain. There are any number of options. We can split off parts of it or not. We can also vote to just send it back to GOL having a discussion tonight so that people get a sense of for GOL to then get a sense of counselors and the public's comments. Okay. So I I did have some comments about it and um I think 51B, which said that individuals um get up to three minutes. But if there is a is if there's a backlog of people wanting to speak, that that the president can reduce it, which has happened on a couple of occasions. But that it would the two minutes. So thank you for at least upping that limit. Um, I thought hard about cutting off public comment after thirty minutes, and I understand the the interest of being efficient with time and getting to our action items. But I think one of our actions is to listen to people and the public comment period is what it is. And I don't believe that we should be trying to um, cut it short and it, with some some sense of um, saving time because I think we have we have other ways of saving time and it's typically not a uh, a long public comment that that drags us late. Um, most of the time public comment is fairly quick. It's like five to ten minutes. It's usually not an issue. <clears throat> My third comment is um, the section uh, must be three, so it's e three. Um, about non non residents and any person not in the register that also struck me as very odd. Um, I understand when we see a name in the attendees list, you don't really know if they're a non resident. You don't really know who they are until they introduce themselves. And um, I never understood why that that line was in there to begin with. And I'd like to have the whole thing struck. Number three, it really is irrelevant. It's public comment. That's Anna. Thank you. Um, question, a couple of questions, bunch of questions. I'll just be honest, a bunch of questions. Um, 3.2, I, I understand that, I understand the rationale in terms of removing, yeah, 3.2. Um, I understand the rationale that you gave in terms of removing it. I think my question is actually for, for Lynn, um, as you've been the only person to serve as president, whether that rule is helpful in setting agendas, right? If you know that there's a um, a goal of getting it done by 10, is that kind of a helpful benchmark and in terms of kind of what to fit in to an agenda? Um, I'm happy to run through all my questions or hear answers now. I don't know who um, wants to tell me. Let what me to make do. sure I'm recording. 
Okay. Okay. So then so it's it's really yeah. is 10 reasonable. No, it's more of it's more of is it helpful to the president in their agenda setting to have a, a deadline, like an end point to shoot for. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if we ever had a president who was a night owl, I'm a little scared of what could happen if if you know they didn't have a an end time. Um but that's playing in hypotheticals. Second question is uh, if the if GOL looked at other towns and and what they did with um, public comment in a really quick look, you know, I noticed that um, most towns do not have a time cap. Most towns that I found, which was a very limited look, but uh, did not have a time cap. Um, but they did have shorter. Many had shorter time periods. So Holyoke has ninety seconds, um, which to have it measured in seconds feels a little brutal. But minute and a half. Uh, you know, East Longmeadow has three, Northampton has two, uh, four, if you need a translator and they cap theirs at 90 minutes. So I, I think I'm just curious about what other models were out there that were explored, um, or if this was the initiative of the committee, which is fine. I'm just curious. Um, and then the other question I had is why the removal of clarifying questions being asked, um, if folks could address that and, um, making sure that we are putting reasonable asks on our clerk of the council to upload if that's if it's reasonable to ask the clerk to upload by noon um, on the the day of just to make sure that that's possible um and then lastly you know to the i uh, save the save the most controversial for last I, I think when we look at the idea of um i believe one of the reasons and correct me if i'm wrong one of the reasons that we uh moving public comment was discussed was that, you know, our meetings are really long and, and it's late. Um, one, that's that's true for the public as well. And if they're there to speak on a specific matter um, that's at the beginning of the meeting and then we're making them wait till the end if they happen to hit that mark, is that is that fair? Um, I also feel that it, it feels a bit like a game of chicken, right? It feels a bit like a game of accessibility of meeting chicken because it seems like we're saying, well, you know, if you if you don't get the first 30, if you don't get in in the first 30 minutes, then, uh, and we we choose to move this to the rest to the end, then we'll wait you out, right? And I, I'm very uncomfortable with the way that that, I know that that, I am very clear that that was not the intention, but that is how it's reading to me. Um, and how it feels to me. So I, I do have concerns with the the thirty minute cap. I also recognize that we don't often hit it, um, which for me means that when we do hit it, it means that there's a really hot issue that we should be listening on, um, and that pushing that to the end of the meeting. Um, again, it also is is making folks who don't necessarily need to be here want to be here for every item have to stay here for every item. We do have to stay here. That's that's the job. And I agree with with Pam that. Our job is also to listen, um, even when it, even when it's listening for for three hours. Thank you. Okay, Jennifer. Jennifer, we can't hear you. I know we've heard you earlier this evening. No. No, we can't hear you. Uh, we'll go on and come back, okay? Andy. So uh, try not to repeat what we've already heard. So there if some positions that have been expressed or things that I su um, support, I, I do think that um, we are here to hear from our constituents and to make sure that their views are expressed and so that we can consider them as we move forward. So I'm um, not, not comfortable at all with the idea of uh, doing anything that um, curtails people from having the right to speak by an arbitrary limit on time, but I do agree that uh, a time for each speech is important in order to um, encourage people to be succinct. Um, the one thing that I liked in the rule that I wanted to point out because it hasn't been mentioned is that frequently uh, the president has said, um, are there any more people um, or I'm going to um, not recognize any additional people raising their hands, asking for public comment. 
and then still five minutes later, hands go up. So there's a rule change that makes it very clear that that's uh, not to be expected. And I think I urge the public that are watching this to understand that if we knew the number was gonna be much larger, then the president might choose to cut from three minutes to two minutes, but she can't make that decision if she doesn't have an accurate re reflection at the beginning of the number. So I just wanted to make that additional point, but um, I, I don't feel the people who do get their hands up when the, it's requested should not be recognized. The other thing that I want to ask the committee to respond to at some point, but not now because uh, we're on a different topic, but I submitted a proposal for some um, changes to the whole legislative process of how bylaws are introduced and handled. And uh, one of the things that I was very disappointed in is that there was no response in no inclusion of anything along those lines, even a very different version. What I, what I submitted, I submitted a very particular thing at the request of the president for process. Um, I, I feel like one of the things that we do is we don't handle certain things efficiently and that's the other flip of time. It's the other use of a lot of time. And so not instead of taking time out by curtailing the number of speakers, I think we should be thinking about how we can make our process more efficient and what kind of screening we can do in order to um, try and make efficient decisions up front as to whether a bylaw proposal merits the amount of time that it's going before all of the committees and the council ultimately uh, that uh, that that discussion needs to have some way of efficiently happening at the beginning. And I felt very uh, uh, firmly about the topic when I raised it previously and hope that it comes back again. Yeah, please do on that one. Andy, I apologize that you didn't get a response, but we haven't gotten to Section 8 yet. So that's why we are not discussing it. We're not bringing it up yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been working through straight through um, numerically. Uh, we are going to change to moving to look at liaisons at our next meeting, and we can bring this up then too. But I want you to understand why it hasn't been addressed yet. And we've actually already spent the better part of two GOL meetings on just the ones that we have brought to you and others we've had discussion, but then said, now we've had a discussion, let's put them to the side and we'll come back to them. So it's, um, this is probably the most thorough review of our rules that's been done since the rules were created. It, it, there's been previous reviews, but uh, thank you for raising that Andy so that people understand that. Thank you to Pat for the response. Yeah. Uh, Dorothy, you have your, oh, Jennifer, can we come back to you and see if we can hear you? Can you hear me? Yes. I have, there's nothing different. I can't explain it, but okay. I'm, but I'll speak. Um, so I just want to say that I um, support, I guess what Pam and Anna uh, had expressed that to me, the syst it's not broken. I, I don't feel that our meetings are extended because of public comment. Most of the time we don't have public comment that goes on for a long period. And when we do, it's because there's something really important to the community that they want to speak about. So I am happy to stay as late as need be um, for all members of the public who wanna to speak to be able to speak and to be able to speak at the beginning and not after 30 minutes have people to have to wait till the end of the after the council has voted and conducted business. Um, I would also ask that I guess 5.1 C should be removed. I guess that's it, the whole new language. Um, I also wanted to question, I think it's 5.1 B3 that a member of the public who's participating remotely couldn't raise their hand to speak after the first person has, after public comment has begun. And I, I find that a little problematic. If 
if public comment is people are speaking and then someone makes a statement that you might want to refute, I don't understand why if public comment is still happening, you couldn't hit the raised hand button if you're participating remotely. And um, I did also what I didn't understand why we were removing counselors asking qualifying questions. So to me, the way I guess it was before worked and it feels like we're um, fixing something that isn't broken. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Dorothy. Um, I don't really need to add anything to what the people of Amherst have already said. I have received so many intelligent and eloquent emails on this topic. Just, you know, every time I'd open my machine today, there'd be more and more. Um, the um, people have to have a chance to speak and saying that you can put something in some kind of online portal or just post it so people can read it or not read it. Um, and it often comes in really too late. I mean, because the idea that we're sitting here with absolutely not going to work, doing nothing the day before a town council meeting, not leaving the house, not eating any meals, whatever, that's a fantasy. So trying to see what's coming in at the last minute is very difficult. Um, we need face-to-face, -face, either in person or on Zoom, that kind of comment. Um, so, I mean, right now in Amherst, we're a very liberal town and we're in a liberal state, but we are being surrounded by non-democratic movements in the U.S. and around the world, which are, you know, the word is being used to describe some of them is fascistic because they're very efficient. But democracy has never been, it never said, oh, to have a democracy, you'll have a really efficient, organized form of government. Because that's not the thing about a democracy. The thing is that people have a chance to speak and to participate. Now, we've made a big move from town meeting to town council. And many people have come in and we were told we would have still have chance to participate and to speak up. And I, I think now saying we're going to cut that or curtail it or time it or limit it and put all kinds of rules on it, I think is really not a good idea. Um, I think Anna said that if it lasts a long time, then there's a reason. OK, and, and it means that there's something that people want to speak about that they feel very strongly about. Um, I do not like the idea that people have to kind of sign up and register at once, particularly since, you know, the, they don't know people who unless you are in the meeting as a participant, you don't know who's in the room with you. I attend many, many meetings just as a participant, as an as an onlooker, and I don't know who's there. So. It's, there could be nobody there. There could be 100 people there. Um, I think that the um, uh, chair of the town planning board has started to read off the names. For town council, that might be too long. But I think not even knowing who's in the room and being told you get signed up right away or you can't speak, I think that, again, is the kind of rule that makes people feel I'm just nothing. They don't think I matter, that I don't value. I'm just not valued. So I, 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 I'm very upset truthfully, that these suggestions were even put forward. The response from people is one of such really outrage, kind of like, what did we do to deserve this, putting us in some special little box? We, shall, we shouldn't waste your time speaking or having thoughts or ideas or participating. So I, I think it's a, a bad idea and I would not do any of the changes. Thank you. Mandy Jo. So in case people haven't figured it out yet, I am the one that proposed these to start a conversation. I'll own it. Um, I was actually surprised it made it through GOL on a unanimous recommendation with one absent because I expected a conversation to be started so that we could have what we're having tonight to discuss what is the role of public comment, not just during a meeting because public comment comes at us as we can all acknowledge all the time. And should we be privileging one form of public comment over another and saying one is more important than another? So these conversations are good. Um, I'm happy to take it back to GOL to continue that conversation. I did wanna address Anna's question about, I think she was one of the ones that said, what about other councils? So um, I looked at 20 or 30 today. I don't have a full list. Um, councils with total time limits, Holyoke, they have a 90 second per person, but a 10 speaker limit which means 15 minutes total. Northampton, as Anna said, a 90 minute limit. 
Framingham has two different, they have a 15 minute limit for general public comment. And then when they put in a, a public comment period on for an agenda item, they have another 15 limit minute limit for each of those. Melrose has a 10 minute limit that is only suspended by unanimous consent. Councils that don't even put public comment on their agenda include Somerville and Leminster. Councils that have registration requirements where if you're not registered before the meeting starts, not before public comment starts, but before the meeting starts, um, you can't speak at all. Um, Agawam, Methuen, Newburyport, Watertown, Cambridge, Pittsfield. Cambridge re is registration is online only. Councils that have other rules, Bridgewater and Medford, most of theirs are that they have their public comment at the end of a meeting. Bridgewater actually does not allow non-residents to speak um, during public comment. So it is a wide variety of things that I hope GOL will continue to discuss to see um, what is best for Amherst because each town has to decide what it's, is best for itself. Thank you. Kathy. I'm, I'll start out by saying I don't want to limit, just so I can be clear. And if this is going back to GOL for more creativity, um, that's fine. We even had one public comment say 90 seconds wouldn't be unreasonable, that you ought to be able to get a verbal comment down to that. I like the idea, and I don't see it here, that if our town clerk is able to put in a document for us everything we've gotten in writing that people feel that we actually saw what they sent in. Um, so that is that people don't feel like they can only give public comment verbally the night we're meeting. So I'm not sure that says that anywhere here. Uh, I'm not sure at all why we needed to rewrite um, the numbering is maybe E3, the non-residents and the very long one. We had this other non-residents as well as residents not on a register since we haven't had a register. It's not clear to me that that's never been in effect. And non-residents, we have usually just adjusted to let everyone speak. Um, so I wasn't sure why we needed to even rewrite that um, since it hadn't come into being. So part of my question is, as GOL is looking at our rules, if something is not making things work badly, why change it? Um, I think we've been adjusting, particularly the president's more recent in the last year or so saying, everyone who wants to talk, please raise their hand if they, she sees that there's 60 or 70 or 80 people. I mean, we can look at that list and see there's a lot of people and you could go down to two minutes. So we've got a lot of flexibility to make sure everyone can speak. So I'm, I'm, urging GOL to go back and not feel that there's a need just to rewrite things for the sake of rewriting things if they're working all right. I do have a question. I don't understand. I think we currently have counselor staff may ask for questions of fact, and it's being removed. Counselors may be recognized as a presiding officer. I'm not sure why that was taken out, and I'm not sure whether we even know it's there. So that's a question. And then way back when on the 10 o'clock, I think it's a good thing to set a goal, even if we never do it. I mean, 10 o'clock says, we would hope that sometimes we would get out of here in three and a half hours. I mean, we, or we can make it 1030. But the that purpose of it was just at least have an aspiration. And maybe we'd rearrange agendas if it looked like we need to meet more frequently because there were three in depth. So I'm not sure it's smart to just be silent on an aspiration, and I'll stop. I'm going to pass until, and go on to Anika and then come back later after others have commented. Anika? Okay, so I might go a bit uh, against what my comment is by commenting, but... Um... <laughs> You know, so I um I I want to appreciate uh, Andy's comments about how we can be more effective, and also recognize that um, I believe every member of of GOL knows that we need to listen 
uh, to residents in order to govern the town and, and guide us. So um, I, I hope that this will not be something that is uh, weaponized. Um, but I also feel that, you know, if we sometimes, and I don't say this to shut any of us down because I do it just as much, sometimes we have 13 people and, and sometimes just kind of repeating the same thing when maybe your questions, your comments, your thoughts have been addressed. And I feel like if, you know, I, and again, this isn't to shut down, I don't, you know, tell us each what to do, but I feel like we could probably maybe knock off an hour just with that, um, you know, in, in certain cases, you know, and I think that uh, it is important for us to all express ourselves, but, you know, sometimes we do have just a, um, you know, repetitive, everyone is expressing the same thing with maybe a few different words and now I'm repeating myself. So I will let that go, but that was just my my thought there. Thank you. Shalini. Um, uh, I wanna appreciate Mandy Jo for being brave enough to bring this up. Uh, but I think I, want, I appreciate the intention behind it that we have a conversation, which is what we're having. And, um, I mean, dare I say, we're amorous, we're only H is silent. So, you know, we definitely want to hear counselors, but I just appreciate what Anika just said, that I think it's on us as counselors to role model how we can avoid um, repetition. I like to hear who's saying what so if they vote in a particular way I like to know what they're thinking so I want to hear everyone but maybe the person can just say that I agree with what Anna just said you know I agree that the 10 o'clock rule would support maybe guide the president to define the agenda that way so I don't have to go over the whole comment so maybe that's one way and I think for democracy to work um it's it's a dance between the public and the residents and the staff and us council members. So it, for us to make good decisions in council, it's important that we don't work too late. And so it's also incumbent upon, you know, the the residents who are coming to to be sensitive to that and maybe also say, okay, come in and say, I just want to support the comments that have been made instead of reading the whole comment again. So it's just like, just being empathetic towards each other. Um, that's what I want to say for now. Okay, are there any other counselors who would like to comment? Um, clearly this is probably going to be a referral back to GOL um, that, I'm not making a motion because we promised public comment before we would do any motions or votes. Um, let me just say that first and foremost, public comment is a requirement of open meeting law. It is a requirement of all committees to have public comment. And when somebody tells me that some other town doesn't even provide it, I wanna go, you're kidding me, right? I value public comment. In fact, Tonight is a perfect example of reading where we are with something and adding a specific public comment because it became quite apparent beginning with emails, probably Saturday, although I try to take Saturdays off, believe it or not. Um, and actually then on Sunday and on into today, so that as late as four o'clock this afternoon, I reworked the agenda to add a specific public comment. In addition to that, as we go back to, and take this back to GOL, there's some other practices that we have had. One is specific public comment. Others include having an hour before a regular meeting of the council where a specific topic is discussed and um, there's public comment, sometimes an expert might be added in. Um, in addition to that, we've added some other things. Um, in fact, even tonight, Athena has a QRS code that she can show you that you can take a picture on the screen that will allow you to go immediately to the place where you can post public comments. And what, 
somebody did ask whether it was reasonable to have public comments that people have agreed to have posted, which means you've submitted it through the general public comment page. Um, can, we, we did discuss with Athena and can she do that by noon on the days of meetings? Yes. In order to separate it by topic, no. That is a much more labor intensive uh, thing to do. Um, and even now I have probably 10 additional emails I haven't responded to. Uh, I will get to them. <laughs> I'll try to do it in an updated kind of way. Um, and as mundane as Scott Mersbach suggests my emails are, which is fine. Um, I like the mundane emails. Uh, so I, this is a very a healthy conversation. I'm glad the council is having it. Uh, and uh, before I'm gonna take two more comments, one from Dorothy and one from Athena, and then we're going to go to general public comment. Dorothy, you've already spoken once, but is yes. there what else? I want to say that I don't think this is the way to have a conversation. The emails I got were very disturbed. Uh, people were upset. They were expressing a great sense of distrust of us counselors and of the whole town council. And we're moving towards a moment of a big vote. This is a time when we're trying to show the town is in order. The council is paying attention to what its needs and wants are. And we're proceeding in an orderly, rational way. So I don't, I don't think it's funny. The, the emails I got were very, very disturbed and were showing that people were thinking my government is not really listening. So I, I just want to express that. That's it. Dorothy, I was not in any way implying that was funny. Adding an additional public comment. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't say you were. Thank you. Okay, I didn't appreciate that. Uh, Athena, you have your hand up. Quick correction, the open meeting law doesn't require public comment periods, but our charter does. Ah, thank you. Our charter does. Um, so other other governments obviously don't. Uh, Alicia, one more comment, and then I'm going to general public comment. Um, yeah, thank you, Lynn. I, I wasn't going to talk just because I was opposed to this for every reason that was already said, but one thing that I wanted to emphasize um, that I wasn't sure was emphasized enough was that I also agree with having public comment first. So not limiting it, but having it first, because I do think it, it can be an equity issue to have people wait through entire meetings um, or, you know, who can stay is who can comment when people can come at the beginning and comment. I think that would work best in terms of making sure it's equally accessible to all people. Okay, thank you. So uh, with that, Please raise your hand if you were in the audience um, on Zoom and you would like to make public comment. Right now I see five hands, six, eight, Okay, so let's try this. Uh, we now have 12 hands for public comment. I'm going to go ahead and do the three minutes that we generally do, but I really would like to ask people who have raised their hands to speak that they, if, you know, it's a, it, if it basically says it's been said, recognize that and go on. So we want to recognize you for weighing in and let's see how we can do this. So the first person is Jeff Lee. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Jeff Lee from District 5. Um, and I oppose any shortening or rescheduling of the time allotted for public comment at town council meetings. Um, as elected public servants, you should be encouraging public discourse, not throwing up obstacles. Um, I think listening may be the most important part of the business you conduct. I'd also like to urge town council to encourage state representative Dom and Senator Comerford 
to continue advocating for permanently allowing remote public participation in local government meetings. Uh, this is another important step in promoting local democracy. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Meg Gage, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, everyone. I'm Meg Gage. I live at 208 Montague Road in North Amherst. And I have two pages of notes, which I'm going to try not to repeat what anyone said. But I, first of all, really appreciate the hard work that all of you do. And I really think I understand how difficult serving on the council has become. Uh, and I, uh, I think this proposal is an effort to make your meetings more efficient and shorter. Uh, and some would have us and, and to work better. Uh, and I think there are things that could be done to make that happen. And I for particularly hope we pay attention to the opportunity in 2024 to review the charter and look at how things might be restructured. I'm not sure. But solving the council process by reducing public participation invites ridicule and is, in my opinion, the opposite of what we need now. It's almost like a self unnecessary self-inflicted wound. Uh, it, it's a bad look, but more important than being a bad look or, or of appearance, um, it's, it's a really bad idea for a couple of other reasons. We have some intense issues right now that the public cares deeply about, as others have said, budget issues, race, improving communications with the police and so on, um, and working to win this important, wonderful new school. This is not the time to alienate residents or reduce the input of residents. And the second reason this is sort of unseemly is that it's not coming at the same time as alternative proposals for meaningful participation. Um, it seems you don't, because it's an idea to limit participation, but not creating some new mechanisms that might be more meaningful. It seems callow, in my opinion. I'm gonna skip that next paragraph. Uh, the town has a lot of people with significant knowledge about and experience with organizational development, specifically about how to build meaningful participation in public processes. Let's talk to those people. Let's think about other things we could do. The school building process is an amazing example where we, no one can say they didn't have a chance to have input and their input was ignored. And as a result of that process and what must have been some tedium of listening and listening to a lot of input, everybody's behind this project, everybody I know. And um, we have a really strong school campaign. I was on the Charter Commission and one of the powerful arguments advocates of the new charter made was that creating this new government would bring a huge improvement and increase in public participation. Many of us remember that promise. Let's try to make that real. Thank you, Bye. Bye. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> I, uh, thank you, Meg, for joining us. Allegra Clark, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Uh, hi, Allegra Clark, District 2 again. Um, I would like to second what everybody just said. I had two specific concerns that were raised by some of the other counselors' concerns as well. Um, I think the first one is about raising, you know, a member of the public not raising their hand immediately when the public comment period starts. Um, I think there are a, a number of barriers to that. For one, um, for example, tonight, the first general public comment period was posted on the agenda as a specific time. And I believe it started at least half an hour, if not more later than that time. So if somebody is for example, in the middle of a shift at work and signs on to, to give public comment because they are made aware that that's the time it starts and they don't, they're not sitting there for the whole meeting, that would limit their participation. Um, I think m the other concern that I would have is around limiting non-residents to speaking during public comment. Um, there are so many non-residents that the town budget impacts um, in terms of people who work in our schools, people who work for DPW, people who work in the police department in Cress. 
who can't afford to live here because the housing prices are so out of control um, that by not allowing them to speak at public meeting because they are not residents, that's not an equitable solution to public process. Um, even though they don't live here, the decisions that are made in these meetings have a major impact on their life. Um, and if I did not mention teachers, I, I apologize. They are obviously a group that has come forward and talked about how they can't afford to live in this town um, with the wages that they're currently being paid. So I would urge you not to limit public comment to just residents as many people can't be residents at this point in this town. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Allegra. Kaylee Brow. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, my name is Keely Brow. I live in Hadley, um, although I will note that I work at Amherst College. I was a resident of Amherst for 10 years and I spend a lot of my time in Amherst. Um, I'm calling because I disagree with the changes to the public uh, comment policy that have been proposed. Um, I agree with a lot of what has been said. I feel um, really encouraged that a lot of counselors are also um, pretty appalled at this um, proposed changes. Um, as someone who spends a lot of time in Amherst and has lived in Amherst for a long time, I'm personally pretty um, frustrated by the proposal to keep non-residents from making public comment. I think that it's ridiculous for towns, especially in our valley, which is a really interconnected community to try to keep um, public comment limited to only uh, the town that you are in. Um, I live a minute and a half from Amherst and the decisions that you make affect me and impact me. Um, I would also like to say um, that it's really important for a council to weigh the severity of the impact of limiting public comment um, and public discourse right now at a time when nationally our right to protest is under attack. Uh, we need to really seriously consider the impact it will have outside of just um, pushing town council meetings sometimes uh, late. Um, I think that council needs to think about why some of our meetings are running late. If a ton of people are showing up, it's because we really care about an issue and we really deserve to be listened to and not um, pushed to the end of a meeting or limited in um, what we're saying. Thank you, that's all I've got to say. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Hilda Greenbaum, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hilda Greenbaum, 298 Montague Road, District 1, and I will not repeat everything that everybody has already said. The issue of the non-residents not being able to speak was one of the things I wanted to mention. And that's been said. Uh, I want to say that I was very angry and very appalled this morning when I got an email to immediately contact my counselors because our right to speak and public comment was being abridged. And I said, my God, this is a council with no checks and balances. The charter promised us that the council was going to be more open to listening to what the public had to say than 252 town meeting members were. And so I just want to say that I'm really happy that other people agree with me and I don't have to repeat everything they had said. There's one reason I did want to add that hasn't been said yet, and that is you have one committee, CRC in particular, that is taking on huge projects that are extremely contentious. And there is nobody on that committee with any expertise with regard to number one the economics of being a landlord, the laws that we already have in place from, from the town, the state, and the federal government and the Commission Against Discrimination, federal and state, that these people know nothing about that we have to pass anyway. So you really need for that and also the huge article on zoning, they have no clue whatsoever about land use or what planning board or zoning board did. And they've been told by those two boards that they don't know what they're talking about. And it's, that's the reason you need the public comment and the public interaction because committees are going ahead 
writing 44 and 45 page documents about which they know nothing. And so I'm trying to be a little bit less angry about this now that I'm hearing a consensus and I will pass the mic on to somebody else. Thank you for joining us, Hilda. Lenora Brick. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I want to, I, I echo everything everyone's already said, but I want to point out a little bit of an irony tonight of how we had Mindy and Joe here. And, you know, wasn't it great? <laughs> Aren't they awesome how they invite participation, how congenial and atmosphere, how mutually respectful. Like I've, I've talked with them. I've been at their meetings. That's one of the things we love about our, you know, dynamic mod squad that we've sent to the state house. And um, part of why that is, is because they get it. They get that more of us is better, even though more of us is messier and not efficient and not all they but they get how much intelligence and heart there is in the greater room and and you like that i saw how much the counselors love that you know and so let's just let's be that in amherst let's let's not you know the town's morale is really down you know that you know that we're feeling disconnected and polarized and this is definitely not the way to unite us. And so I think we should be doing everything we can to increase public participation, to increase morale, to, in, to, in, to unite us, to, to bring more um, res mutual respect. I do get that you guys work really hard, too hard, too much. Um, your job is too hard. And maybe the amendments that need to happen in the charter need to be in other things like like maybe you need more counselors you know to spread it out more maybe you need more outside expertise in some formal way to be introduced maybe you need to have uh maybe we need conversations with a different format that isn't just the the town council meetings i don't know i'm, I'm sure there's ways to figure out we don't want you burning out we don't want to burn out. We care about each other. We, we serve each other. Like, let's make this work for everybody. The other thing that um, just the, I think the last two comments. Oh, first of all, we shouldn't be comparing ourselves. Like, third of all, we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to towns that have less participation. Shame on them. Don't even look at that. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, but, and, and I do agree that, that, what's best for Amherst, what's best for each town, each town has to decide, but part of those decision makers are the public, you know, we're, we're all in this together, we all are invested, um, and, and it would be really lovely to create a friendlier way to, um, to participate, so I, I thank you for your good work, I really do, I know how how hard it is. Um, and I and I hope that you can not have these midnight meetings, but do this in a different way. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Lenore. Janet Keller, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Janet Keller. I live at 120 Pulpit Hill Road. And um, I just want to say that you're making the rules that will govern the way we and our families live and whether we'll thrive in our community for a long, long time. So of course, we have really strong feelings about um, these things and we want the reassurance that you've um, taken our lives into consideration. Um, and we want to see that in the preparation. And um, so I'm with those who's, who are saying, please, please keep the democratic, more democratic process and inclusionary process. Public comment doesn't take much time unless there's a really big issue and then we need to take the time to thresh the issues out. Um, and I want to agree that more upfront work on threshing out the real core of these proposals, not, not the legal details, but, but what it's about and what 
the problem is that it's supposed to solve and how it will solve it um, um, and how it relates to the underlying conditions and the benefits to folks' lives. Um, I think that would help a lot. Um, and finally, um, the preparatory meetings that some of these are discussed in, um, I have to note that there are at times that are, that close lots of people out. I can go to them. So I'm not complaining about myself, but um, people who have to be at work and taking care of their kids can't, can't come to these daytime meetings. So thanks for hearing us out. Um, and uh, I appreciate all the work you've done and um, appreciate that, that you did um, give us time to be heard tonight. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Janet. Anita Sorrow, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anita Saro. I live on Chapel Road uh, in District 5. I won't repeat what I put in my letter or, or many of the really good comments that I heard from both the council members and, and from the speakers. Um, but I do want to comment. I was uh, struck by the comment that this proposal was brought forward um, out of a need to start the conversation. And I'm confused and a little troubled by what was the conversation that needed to start. If the conversation is about increasing the efficiency of council meetings or generally the work of the council, then why focus on limiting public comment? Um, so I will ask you that when this goes back to GOL for reconsideration, that it be put in a larger context. It be put in the context of making your lives a little bit easier by being able to get, you know, on with your lives before midnight. Um, because I do appreciate how hard you work. But instead of focusing on one aspect of your agenda, one way of, of doing your work to broaden that conversation and, and to hear some of the really good comments that one of the speakers just a little while ago had or that people have written to you. And as far as listening to what other towns are doing, I was reminded of my junior high experience asking my mom, could I stay out after 10 because my friends were and the comment always was, if they're going to jump off a cliff, are you gonna follow them? So we are independent speakers in this town and I do hope we continue to do that. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Anita, thank you for your comment. Julian Hines, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi there, uh, my name is Julian Hines. I live at 41 Pine Grove in District 5. Um, and I would just like to echo, echo some of the other speakers' concerns about this. Um, and also would like to thank Lynn for giving us the time to speak today and add that, unfortunately, if we were to implement the changes that seem to be proposed or something similar to them, after 10 comments pushing off the rest of the comments to the end of the meeting, which on controversial issues sometimes go till midnight, one, even 2 a.m., um, would not be feasible for many uh, youth like myself. We have school at 8, 9 a.m. in the morning, and to make our bus routes, we have to get up at 6 or 7 a.m. in the morning. So it's not feasible to end up making a comment at 1 or 2 a.m. because that's when the end of the council meeting is. So you're going to be driving out youth voices if you make um, a policy such as this. And you're also going to be driving out the voices of teachers and DPW workers and other folks in town whose workday starts at that same time. So um, those would be my two comments. And I would urge you to vote uh, against this proposal or at least revise it to uh, 
allow youth and town staff and other folks in town to have more access, not less to town government. Thank you very much. Julian, thanks for joining us. Philip Avila, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Hi, my name is Philip Avila. I live in District 2. And I will just say that I am in disagreement with the proposals that have been made. So just want to echo a little bit of what everybody has said. But I do want to focus on why this conversation was brought up. Like, what is the reason for it? And I think as um, Councillor Tops put it, if it's not broken, why try and fix it? So if the reason is not to fix it, then what is the reason for this type of conversation to limit public comment? From my recollection of the past six months, probably a little bit more, I think the public comments period that's gone over 30 minutes have been on racial issues, education, environmental, and policing. I think all those topics, we can all agree, deserve more than 30 minutes of public comment for people to weigh in their opinion on it as residents of this town. So what's the reason for this conversation? In my mind, I think it's a, manip a manipulation technique brought by the person that has put forward this type of discussion. Last, I think that this person who brought this conversation up should reflect on her implicit bias and her promotion of structural racism that she often walks back in the public eye yet still works behind back channels to move that agenda forward. I hope that the residents of this town are paying attention and voice their opinion come this November when it's time to vote out people who silence marginalized communities. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Philip. Brianna, uh, I, I, Brianna Owen, I think. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. And you need to unmute Brianna. You're now unmuted. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can Great. you all hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay. Um, my name is Brianna and I live in North Amherst. <laughs> I want to emphasize, well, first I want to thank you all for your time as counselors. Meetings are really long and I get that. And with that, you all should be receiving um, a reasonable wage that aligns with this huge job. In my experience joining town meetings, the times that public comment is the longest is when people are being represented the least. I think it's critical for each of you to hear different perspectives from different people living in different districts. I also wanna harp on the fact that this is a huge equity issue. And although I'm a broken record reminding you all of the 2020 resolution to dismantle white supremacy in Amherst, I'm doing it again. The council is a white space. Even for me right now, it gives me anxiety to speak. If I went in person, it would be even worse. But public comment over Zoom gives me a way to participate in big decisions and to have my voice heard. I'm very concerned and I hope to see you all start to lean on the CSSJC. This group has a skill set that no this this group has a skill set that the council does not. And it pains me that they are not being utilized as a key component as their charge is representing underrepresented residents and promoting inclusivity to all residents in Amherst, those who may be affected most by this. We are not Northampton, we're not Holyoke, we are Amherst, and this is a channel for people in the community to participate in a government in a way they didn't before, over Zoom and over public comment. Please stop making it hard to engage with, with government leaders. It is not only upholding, but promoting white supremacy as the council has such minimal diversity. Public comment provides an opportunity for different views to be heard. Please don't destroy democracy in Amherst. Brianna, thank you for joining us. Darcy Dumont, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Good evening, my name is Darcy Dumont and I live in South Amherst. I'm commenting tonight on Mandy Jo Haneke's proposed council rules change, limiting public comment to 30 minutes. I wanna first thank Dorothy in particular for her comments and, and many of the other counselors. I'm unhappy that you've made me and others wait until 
9.30 to give our comments when we thought we were going to be giving them at 6.30. Uh, I'm sure some left because of the wait. I firmly believe that pu public comment should be at the beginning of meetings. It actually disadvantages people to have special public comment periods later in the meeting. Uh, this is not a good look for Amherst to limit the time for public comment. When many of the meetings that have gone long on public comment have been regarding issues around racial equity, the look is particularly bad. First, it looks like the council seemed to slip these changes through by not adequately labeling them on the agenda. There's no way that a member of the public simply looking at the agenda would know that this was going to be discussed. Putting the rule changes on the consent agenda is also not transparent. My understanding is that items on the consent agenda are those that would reasonably be assumed to be unanimously agreed to. Does someone think that this rule change would not be controversial? Uh, please discuss the use of the consent agenda at your upcoming retreat. The council also put Councillor Haneke's controversial zoning bylaw proposal on the consent agenda, though it was later removed. How a referral of a zoning bylaw proposal could ever be on a consent agenda is beyond me. In particular, when zoning proposals under state law require a much higher degree of support for referral based on automatically needing to be referred to the planning board and automatically required to provide a public hearing within 14 days. Doing seemingly sneaky stuff like this erodes trust in the council. I understand that the council needs to limit the time spent in council meetings but there are more creative and people-friendly ways to do that than limit the public comment period to 30 minutes. Curtailing public comment appears partisan to those attempting to get their views across. One example of wasting the council's time, in my opinion, is reviewing the council rules annually required by the GOL charge, which was written by Haneke. After five years, an annual review is unnecessary and just an invitation to partisan tinkering. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Darcy. Uh, I see no more hands, therefore it concludes public comment. Pat, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I'm having a lot of trouble with attacking. Um, Mandy Jo is definitely not a perfect person. And I am definitely not a perfect person, nor is anyone else on this council or anyone in our community. I am tired of us, us, the community, using where Mandy lives, what she thinks, what she does. Um, I don't know what underwear she wears, so I can't comment on that. Um, and I'm not trying to be facetious. We have real problems in this town, and I want to take responsibility for making a mistake as chair of GOL. Because Mandy proposed a conversation with the committee, and somehow or other, I allowed a motion to be created. So I want each one of us, every one of us here, and everyone in the community to think about what they're saying. And if you want somebody to change what you consider their racist or attitude or their privileged attitude or their rich attitude, then how can you engage with them so they can hear you? How can we do that together? It, I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of time. Kathy, when you were complimented by Joe and Mindy, that was wonderful. And it made me look at myself because I get irritated by you frequently. And I'm saying that not to be silly, but because I can be dismissive. Don't dismiss opportunities to argue, to fight, to talk about what's real, but don't miss opportunities to 
collaborate, to see each other for our strengths as well as our weaknesses, to see each other across our differences. Stop attacking each other. I'm going to leave the room for a minute. Totally understand. Are there any other counselor comments at this time? Then uh, I'm going to move that this be referred back to CRC and look. GOL. GOL. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, not, not CRC, excuse me, GOL. And I'll be looking for a second. I second it. Okay. Are there That's other first. comments at this time? Dorothy. <clears throat> uh, it you know, the, the minutia of the rules is not an area where you're going to find me leading. Um, but is there no way that we could have a vote and say, vote yes or no and support these rules? Or does it have to go back to committee and then come back to us for another vote? Or can it be killed in committee? I want to know how much more time will we need to spend on this issue? So as in the past, a motion has been made it was seconded. And if you don't agree with that, then you vote no. And you can make a counter motion. Okay. And the counter motion could be that we could, I mean, would or would we be allowed to vote it up or down now in this meeting? That would be, uh, we have to bring the first motion to the floor. Okay. okay. And then mm -hmm. if we vote to refer back, and it passes, then that's the end. But if not, another vote could be taken and it could be a vote to yes or no on okay. this, okay? Because we and, certainly have questions? had a conversation. We have definitely had a conversation. Okay. Okay. Any I, question, Dorothy, on that? Yeah, I, I think I get it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mandy Jo? Um, since the chair of GOL has stepped away um, to answer Dorothy's question, we have a whole list at GOL of re proposed revisions that many counselors have submitted. We're working our way through it. Some of the list has um, GOL has voted not to make the change. And so you haven't seen those. So um, I, I guess what I'm saying to Dorothy is sending this back to GOL could result in it never coming back here as a change or could result in a different proposal coming back. Um, but it that's what we've been doing and working through the rules that were proposed. What does GOL recommend be changed or what does GOL say? No, we don't recommend the proposed changes that came to GOL. Okay, Dorothy, does that is that clear for you? Yes. It, it 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 is at this kind of clear, yeah. Okay. So the motion that's been made and seconded is to refer this back to GOL. Obviously, with the knowledge of this conversation, the many emails we've received, et cetera. Um, is there any other comment? Shalini? Um, and I think uh, what I'm also hearing is that one of the reasons we want um, this to go back is to have a further discussion on ways to reduce the time that I mean reduce the town council time including Andy's you know recommendation or other strategies because I think that was the core purpose of this conversation um, being initiated and I don't think we've come to a resolution how we want to do that so I look forward to hearing what GOL will be discussing further. Okay, Jennifer. I guess it, it's seeming to me a little like apples and oranges. I mean, if, if GOL is going to address how to make our meetings flow more efficiently, that's to me very different than whether we're gonna reduce public comment. I mean, I'm inclined to wanna to see a vote on these up or down on these recommendations. And then GOL can continue to have a conversation about more efficient meetings, or it might be something we wanna take up at our retreat. But I don't see that 
limiting public comment or changing public comment really has a lot to do with the efficiency of our meetings. That's, so I just you know, want to say that. I, I think they're two completely different issues. Okay. Are there other comments from counselors? Right, there is a motion on the floor. Pam. A quick question. So aren't we discussing um, streamlining our meeting process as part of a retreat? Isn't that part of what we plan to do as a full discussion? There, I, I thank you for that comment and question, Pam. We're in the process of developing a list of those issues and you sent some earlier today as well. And um, Michelle is not here uh, for the rest of this meeting, but we actually have a meeting tomorrow to talk about planning the retreat. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. So the only reason I brought it up is that is that we can focus on the changes that we apparently didn't want on this, um, maybe separate from the whole conversation of the streamlining effort. Yes. I hear that. Athena? I just wanted to add something very quickly. Um, we can't hear you, Athena. I wanted to add quickly that there, you counselors do have a, the ability to make a motion to postpone something indefinitely, which effectively kills a motion that's on the floor. Um, but I, what I understand, your, the intent of your motion, what would, that would do is kill everything that's in the proposal from GOL. So if counselors want some of those things to go back to GOL and then come back to the council, then a motion to refer would, mm -hmm. would be the way to do that. So I think what Athena is doing is, mm -hmm. is providing the options. Okay, the options are we refer back to GOL so that they look at it in the entire context of the rules that they're looking at at this point. And the other is the option to postpone indefinitely a vote on this. Um, the second option um, means it remains to be brought back up but in the meantime, GOL may come back with addition, with different changes. Uh, a vote to postpone indefinitely is a vote to not take it up again. How about taking up a change, a, di a different change? I think referring back to GOL would be the best way to do that. Right. Yeah, that's that, OK. I just want to make sure people understand the options. Okay. All right. So referring back to GOL, um, clearly that's the motion that's on the floor that's been made and seconded. That gives GOL the opportunity to look at it in the context of the larger issue, as well as the possibility that that's part of how we, one of the issues we discuss at our retreat. The other option is a postponement indefinitely, which means it's basically done. So are there any questions? Okay, the motion on the floor is referred back to GOL. That's been made and seconded. Okay. Um, All right, we're going to begin the um, vote with Pat DeAngelis. Yeah, the, the, this is a referral back to GOL. That's the motion on the floor. Okay, Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. <laughs> Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller is absent, I'm sorry. Uh, Pam, Dorothy Pam. No. Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane. No. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. 
No. Alicia Walker. No. Uh, Shalini Baumilne. Yes. The motion passes with eight in favor, four opposed, no abstentions, and one absent. Is that how you confer? Thank you. We are going on to the next. It's a conversation. It is not a, a vote. It is regarding the town council meeting format. Although we, what we learned this evening is that it appears that there will be a, an extension of the present format coming from both the House and the Senate, but they have not acted on that yet. So with that, I'm going to call on Athena who put together a memo in your packet and she has a slide or two to go with this. Thanks. I'm going to quickly um, just review some of the things that you, I put. You need to speak into your mic again. I'm sorry, honey. I'm going to give a quick summary of what I put in my memo and raise a couple other points that I think should be helpful for your discussion. So the current status that will expire on March 31st allows meetings with that provide adequate alternative means of access. So that means fully virtual public meetings. Um, and they could be held with less than a quorum. So we're all used to this. This is what we're doing now. What happens after March 31st, if there isn't legislation passed, public bodies are subject to all the open meeting law requires requirements as of April 1st. If there is new legislation, public bodies may continue to meet virtually without a quorum physically present. If there's a gap between what we have currently and new legislation, which, which we saw happen the last time there was a, an expiration date, then in the interim, public bodies would need to meet in accordance with all the provisions in the open meeting law. Yeah. We plan to give the council timely updates about that legislation and what's going on, um, but I wanna raise a couple of issues. Meetings that are planned for after April 1st may have deadlines that are before the expiration date and maybe before we hear about what the legislation is doing. So for example, on March 24, we have a public forum on a debt authorization for the school. I'm sorry, that's happening on later in April, but the deadline to post it is March 24. So that's something that we need to be aware of. The council has a meeting on April 3rd. The deadline to post that is before the expiration date. Finance Committee and CRC are meeting the first week of April, so I'm just reminding chairs to take that into consideration when you're planning your meetings. We need to think about where those meetings are happening and what's going on with the current legislation. Like Lynn and Mandy and Joe said, the legislation is underway. So far, the House has passed a supplemental budget bill that extends that would extend it to March 31st. We need to hear from the Senate and the governor before um, that will go into effect. So for meetings after April 1st, like I said, public bodies should be prepared to meet in person. If there is no expiration, if there is no extension before April 1st, members may participate remotely, but they need to request that from the chair. And then the town has a remote participation policy that regulates use of remote, remote participation at public meetings. Um, I strongly encourage counselors to review the remote participation policy. There were links to it in my memo. Um, a quorum would need to be physically present and I think it's gonna be worthwhile for the council to consider what will happen if the chair or the president has too many requests to allow a meeting to be held. Do we cancel that meeting? How do we give preference to which counselors? I think there are some issues of equity there that could be worth considering. For the council, um, that threshold would be six counselors, more than six counselors requesting remote participation. And then it's much a smaller threshold for committees. So CRC, GOL, and TSO are three and five members for finance. Um, we agree with what Mindy and Joe said that virtual public participation works and we're committed to continuing that forever, Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for as long as we're doing this, <laughs> for as long as we can. Um, and um, upcoming decision points for the council. If the council determines that they wanna change the format for committee meetings, I think we're planning on having an agenda item at the next council meeting and we can take that up then. And um, I also wanted to mention that the planning board met recently in person and they just used 
the one camera rather than everyone having devices. So it could be worth considering when we're having a discussion about committee meeting format, if that's gonna be an option that committees are more comfortable with, that would be slightly less labor intensive in terms of managing the meeting and, and maybe committee chairs would be able to manage that themselves and people wouldn't have to bring their laptops if they didn't want to and so on. I, before we move on, Andy, I, I'd like to ask for clarification. So you said they used one camera. Right, so this, this camera up here that shows the wide angle of the room, mm -hmm. you can see on Zoom with my name, there was, we had a table set up in the middle of the room and all the members were seated around the table. There was still room for attendees in the room and on Zoom. And they didn't have their individual cameras on. It was just that one camera that was on. Did they take public comment through Zoom? I don't know. So they the, did do a hybrid meeting. Right. It was hybrid, but okay. just with one the one and, camera rather than everyone having their cameras. And on. when they did that, did they have an IT person backing up the meeting? Okay. That's that's where the problem lies. For council and council committees, we, we always have a minute taker. Um, it would be up to chairs whether or not they're willing to take on that task, but um, I'm committed to making sure that this will work, the hybrid meetings will work if committees decide to go hybrid. So I feel confident that I can work between myself and other staff members that support council committees, we can make that work. Okay. Um, it, okay, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, actually, it's just follow up on where we were. So, um, you've spoken to council and council committees, but our form of government is loaded with lots of boards and committees of all kinds, and all are subject to the open meeting law. Do we have the capacity? to do anything other than uh, in-person meetings for the large number of committees that are that exist. Mr. Bachman. No, not at the level that we support the council committees, the council and its committees. Um, we, we are looking to outfit several rooms that can make it as, um, to make them more accessible. Um, but many times we have more than the three rooms or four rooms that we have available for public meetings. So um, our default would be to meet in person um, with the ability, with trying to expand the ability for people to, to at least watch uh, remotely. Okay, Andy, did you have further questions? No. Okay, um, I just wanna speak to the council and the council committees, but separately. I want to really emphasize what Athena has said. All along, we have been committed to continuing the hybrid mode so that people can attend meetings either by being in the room or attend virtually, and in both instances, can make public comment. And I personally see no reason to change that. In fact, I was quite surprised to recently realize that neighboring towns haven't even gone as far as we have, that they've just continued to meet virtually. And I mean, their town councils. So we've been in this mode for a year plus, probably 14 months or so, uh, 15 months. And personally, I love it when people and counselors have continued to come back in the room. Um, I think it makes for a much better meeting, but I also think that we've learned that the public really does participate more if we provide Zoom um, access, either participate by making public comment or it's just another way of watching. When it comes to committees, I'm going to be very interested to hear from various committee chairs about that because in the past, when we explored that, it was almost like we needed to have one of the committee members being able to manage Zoom. And some of us have gotten better at that. 
until we have a hiccup and then we're not so good at it. So I, that's, I think, an other, another consideration. However, I do absolutely want to speak to April 3rd is a critical meeting for this council. We have to have a quorum planned to be in this room and the person presiding has to be in this room because we did have a huge gap in there. And as Athena just said, we have to post that meeting by the 24th. So uh, because we have a public forum at that meeting about the school bond uh, mo motion. So those are just some things. And um, other than that, I let's move on to other people's uh, comments. Dorothy? Um, well, I wanna look at this um, as somebody who is trained in the theater. And um, I wanna get something cleared. The picture that we're seeing now of the town room, um, I'm just a member of the public looking at it. I can't even tell if those are people sitting there um, I have no sense of that. So I, there's nothing to watch. There's no people, there's no facial expressions. Um, I didn't even know Mindy and Joe were sitting there until you asked them to turn around. It's just blobs to me. And supposedly my eyes are normal, although Zoom does stress them out a lot. So I just see that as a really boring thing for the public to watch. Um, because you're saying that we're going to cut down the technology because the, because right now I see you because each one of you has on your own laptop in front of you and you're looking into uh, its camera and somebody is coordinating that. Um, I got to tell you, production values really matter. And I don't see people being happy um, looking at that room and say, thinking that they're at the meeting or seeing the meeting. I don't. Um yeah. So I, I, so I don't quite know how we're going to do it, but um, the today is in, in the world today, we don't go to lower levels of technical proficiency. We keep going to higher levels and people are used to being able to see things and whatever. And I think you'll find that people don't like going back to that, even though it might be easier on lots of other people, you know, our staff and whatever. So Athena, I don't think you were suggesting for council that it be any different than we see it today, is that correct? No, I wasn't suggesting that change for right. council meetings. Yeah, so we would all remain on camera, um, on individual cameras. Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, the key point here is that this is not a choice. If the legislature doesn't act by March 31st, it's not a choice for us. The law allowing us to do this way fall goes away and then we have to go back to the pre-COVID times when everybody has to be in the room. This is not a choice that we're, presenting it's Athena was trying to lay out what could happen if the legislature fails to act by March 31st so and and we are trying to be prepared for that eventuality because they don't often and they didn't act by March 31st last time uh, they they went well into the next two weeks I think I think so, so we will have this time period where we have to figure out what we're allowed to do legally so the meetings can be considered legal meetings right so Athena and Paul I have another clarification before we move on to the next one and that is can we still have public comment by zoom if they don't act yeah yes we can thank yes. you we can we can have meetings like we have been we just need to have the chair in the president in the room and a quorum in the room. Okay, so thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure that we all understood that side of it. And um, if I can clarify, my suggestion for the, the one camera was for committees to make it easier for council committees who would be, if there's no legislation before March 31st, required to meet in person. And in, that was a suggestion just for discussion. I'm not pushing right. that either way. Got that. Uh, Pam, you had your hand up. It was a it was kind of a stupid question, and that is why does it matter if the if the state hasn't passed it? We still hold our meetings; they still get recorded. Um, do we get fined if we, you know, do it like that? Yeah. Um, the, they come crashing at the door, and uh, the the meeting wouldn't be considered a legal meeting. So any actions taken at that meeting would not be considered. Anybody could challenge that action that was taken by that committee. 
we we would be considered in violation of open meeting law. Okay, Kathy. It just to um, since when when we first ran the first couple of years this absent but present rule, you had to file out a piece of paper. I mean, they it was an online piece of paper, and then the chair because I or the presiding officer had to agree to have you not be there except on remote. You know, so it's a pain in the neck is, is when, you know, we could, as long as there's seven of us here, we can keep meeting. But the old rule was you actually had to say in advance, you weren't going to be there in person. And this is how you wanted to be there in remote, at least remote's easy now. The old remote was you called in on a phone number and, oh, and it was horrible. It was really horrible. <laughs> I felt I remember Shalini was one time not able to be here and was phoning in and I think we lost connection with her three or four times. So um if this I, this is the re preferred remote participation. Yeah. Yeah. If 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 I can um speak to what Kathy just mentioned. It is cumbersome to have to file that piece of paper when you're doing remote participation, but it's really important when you need a quorum in the room to to make sure that it's okay with right. the chair. Yeah, right. no, I, I was just saying it's the there's that extra step. It's not hard. It's just an extra step. Yeah. Right. Well, and there is a strong suggestion that except an emergency, it be filed 48 hours in advance. So. Right, because then a chair will know if they have a quorum right. or not. I mean, it, it, and you know, that little email I send out to you that says, will you be in person or virtual? You, you're going to start getting terrible reminders <laughs> if you don't answer, because I need to know I've got a quorum in the room. Um, Kathy, anything else? That's okay. Mandy, Joe. So to, I guess, get back to where we are, I support staying with how we've been doing this um, if the law doesn't get passed seven of us have to show up right, right as a council to answer athena's question as a chair um if we have to go in person um as a chair i would want to be able to access the screen um i don't know which camera or figure out i know we used to be able to do that and there were some issues with it and all because at least for crc we've we've gotten really we, we do it in gol a lot too and it was a lot more cumbersome Pre Zoom, but we do a lot of sharing of so everyone can see it. So it would be really important for someone in in the room to be able to access the screen and also whatever's going out on Zoom to be able to see that screen too. And um, so that that would sort of be the one request. Um, you know, we'd need three people in the room, so it would be really important for people to have to submit those forms so that we knew we had the three on the other request from Athena, you know, in terms of if a chair got, as a committee chair, if I got three requests for remote um, and I needed to hold the meeting because it was a public hearing, say, as CRC sometimes does, I, I would probably, without further discussion, unless we discuss differently, would start with those who I, I would start with seeing if there are ones that of people who are not in town for the meeting and would probably think to approve them first and not necessarily approve for remote the ones that are sitting in the town. Um, but that would be my first initial instinct. But I'd love to hear from counselors if that happens. Do we cancel a meeting or how do we choose who to approve remote or not? Right. And one of the things is that between now and the 20, the 20th, when we meet again, I believe every committee has a committee meeting. Whether it was posted on your agenda or not, maybe a different issue. I'm thinking about finance particularly. Um, and, you know, you may want to have a discussion among your members um, regarding that. So. We're not voting tonight one way or the other on this. And even if we vote on the 25th, we may not be voting with any knowledge of what the legislature is going to do. Okay. Are there other questions or comments or other chairs of committees or just counselors that want to weigh in on committee meetings? Okay. 
Okay, then I, you're done with that. And we'll move on to appointments. There's none. Committee reports, uh, CRC, Mandy Jo. Um, we started the hearing. Um, it got con on the, the duplex and other bylaw proposal. It got continued till April 5th, 6th. What's the Thursday? Sixth <laughs> till till April sixth at four thirty five, um, and we will be. We've got a meeting next week and a meeting on the thirtieth, and those will mostly be on rental registration again. Um, we're starting the appointment process for finding appointments and candidates. We're recommending appointments and finding candidates for the ZBA and the planning board. So start putting your feelers out. The next meeting, um, CRC will be approving the bulletin board posting to go up on the bulletin board. So make sure people don't fill out anything until that bulletin board posting goes up approximately a week and a half from now. Okay. Um, Kathy, elementary school building. Nothing to report. Okay. Uh, Andy, finance. Finance committee, uh, I, we submitted a report, so I think that I, at this point, principally, of course, if somebody raises their hand, um, we'll ask that they be recognized to, and the committee will respond to questions that are asked. Um, committee is meeting tomorrow. It's going to be a uh, one of our different meetings because uh, the major um, major items include some annual requirements that um, are very different. One is to review the audit with the auditor. The other is to remove, review an OPEB document with the actuary who uh, uh, did an update of um, an anal the analysis that's required to be done every other year on uh, where we stand as far as what our other post-employment benefits requirements are. Uh, and the third item that is on the agenda, and I don't know how much time we'll have for discussing it, but it's because of the deadline, we do want to start it as the referral from the last meeting about uh, counselor compensation. Um, it has not been discussed in the committee because it was referred the day before um, and we couldn't notice that. So it is on the agenda for this meeting. As I transition from, are there any questions for finance? As I transition from finance to GOL, am I correct that the finance non-voting residents, we might have one vacancy coming up? And when does that get done? It gets done by GOL and it gets done in the spring. So we've got to get that scheduled. Okay, uh, Pat, GOL. Well, there's not a lot to say. <laughs> um, I do, uh, we are going to be continuing our work with the rules of procedure uh, on the 15th. Um, and our meetings now start at 930. What I do want to say is sponsors of resolutions and proclamations need to get to me by the Friday before, which is the 10th, a clean copy of their um, proclamation or resolution. If it's only a date change, fine. But if there are any additions or changes, I need that clean copy sent to me directly. And then I will make sure it gets in the packet Friday by five o'clock, Friday by 430. OK, thank you. Oh, and that's for the Arbor Day uh, Jewish heritage. And I believe I don't know if anything is really going to happen with the women's history. So the folks working on the Jewish heritage um, think, and I have to have it on Friday. Okay, and Arbor Day and the third one, what was the third one? Okay. All right. Um, any questions for GOL? Um, and stated earlier, GOL continues to work on all of the many suggestions around the rules of procedure. Um, JCPC, Kathy? 
our meeting Thursday, I'm just trying to figure out exactly, we have schools on it and planning. It's the last meeting where we're going over the proposals. So next week we start talking about what we've heard, um, putting together what our recommendations are, and then we continue that. And at some point we write our report. And, and just so everyone remembers, we the report is a recommendation to the town manager um, from the original proposals we have. So uh, that's the schedule. I just checked, Sean has not posed posted yet the documents for this Thursday, but it will be schools and planning um, for anyone who wants to come and listen. Thank you. Any questions? Jones Library, Anika? We have not met since the last meeting. Okay, TSO, Anika? Okay, so we met uh, this past Thursday and uh, we had the bulk of the meeting went to a conversation around the proposed bylaw for refuse collection and recyclable materials. So we had a informative update from Paul and the expert, our expert with this, Susan White, and um, that discussion was carried out by sponsor leader Shallon. Our next meeting will be this Thursday, March 9th, and upcoming agenda items are the surveillance use policy and street lights policy. Thank you. Any questions for TSO? Any liaison reports, including, not really a liaison, it's AHRA, but uh, Michelle is not here. Pam? Sorry, question for TSO. Can you tell me the status of the Snow and ice bylaw. Thank you. GOL. Oh, is it GOL now? So you'd like to ask GOL that question? I'd like to ask GOL that yes. question. Okay. <laughs> GOL doesn't want to answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, right now, I'm waiting for uh, information from the tree warden. Um, so we're it's on hold. It should come up at the next meeting, but if I don't have uh, more information from him about what he needs. I've gotten some information from uh, uh, the director of D Mo uh, Guilford Mooring, but it doesn't quite jive with the letter that they send out. So I have to figure that out with the warden. And that'll be coming up. It's not going to affect the season, but it will affect spring. So there's still chance to insert a word or two? Of course. Uh, send it to me. Uh, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, any liaison reports? Pam, you have your hand up, but I think it's from before. Okay. Uh, see none. Town manager. Re I'm sorry, Dorothy. Um, this is going back to Pat. Um, my brain wandered. Uh, I have a couple of emails that I've gotten recently about the, the snow shoveling. Are you saying that that questions that people have sent me on that I should send to you? Yes. Okay. Thank you, because I, I do really do want to have a response. I didn't have an answer, so I will be sending two things later tonight. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions or comments regarding committee reports, liaison reports? All right. Then we're going to move to town manager report. Uh, there's a written town manager report and Paul. Sure, I do have a few things I'd like to report on. Um, we are scheduling March 24th as a cup of Joe with Kathy Shane and Sean Megano to talk about the schools, have another opportunity for people in a more informal setting just to come and talk about the, school, the new elementary school building and um, concerns or anything that people wanna share with that. Um, also to let you know that town hall uh, will be closed on Thursday, uh, this Thursday from, uh, it will open at one o'clock. We are trying to take four mornings a year to do professional development for all of our staff. What we have found when we've tried to do that in the past and try to keep um, some of the, the, keep the offices open and that some people were disadvantaged and they didn't have the opportunity to join. And uh, it was, it just created some friction. So Town Hall used to be closed every Thursday morning um, in, in years past, um, and we, we kept, we opened it 
Um, but this is one opportunity for our staff to be able to get some professional development. We're focused on DEI training at this one. Um, the third thing I want to mention was the, um, we do have the big night, which is where the salamanders move across the road and do their thing. Um, this, we're working um, with the Hitchcock Center because it's a, it's a very popular thing in Amherst. They tend to be on Henry Street in North Amherst. We will probably on the night that it actually happens, it's, it always happens on a warm night in March or April when it's above 40 degrees and rainy. Um, and that's when they go to do their mating ritual. Um, and a lot of people are on the road trying to protect them as they cross the road if they don't use the little tunnels that are built. Um, on that night, uh, we will probably close Henry Street to protect the people, most likely, and, and the salamanders, <laughs> and detour people around. We will have signs up alerting people that this may happen in advance. Uh, we usually you know the forecast, and the scientists know when it will happen. Um, but we just think that talking with police and uh, fire and uh, DPW, they felt the safest thing to do is to detour people around that section of Henry Street. So that will you'll notice that at some point. <laughs> I do mention um, Greece in a town report, town manager's report. It's an important thing for us because it's really the, the impact of Greece going down drains, especially from our restaurants, is really damaging our wastewater system. So um, I can tell you as much as you want about that, but our we have a really an interdisciplinary team from wastewater, from DPW, from health, the Board of Health, our, our inspectors all working together on that. Um, the... Um, we've been hearing a lot about the condition of our roads, and we do have a bid going out um, in the near future, um, and we don't know what the, um, how much is going to cost to do the roads, because there are only three companies that really are participating and who can do um, road construction, um, and all the cities and towns and the state are all vying for these contractors, so we're, we have our bid going out. We, ho we hope that we get a good, attractive bid on it um, and we get as many roads paved as we can and we continue to looking for options to develop, get more funds to help address the really bad uh, condition of many of our roads in town. There's a lot of roads that need <laughs> attention. Um, the, um, on Tuesday, uh, Andy mentioned that the Finance Committee will be here uh, receiving the audit. This will be uh, Sonia Aldrich's second swan song. Her last day of work was Friday. Thank you to the counselors who were able to come in and, and wish her good luck. Um, she was going to be um, helping us on certain projects and helping Sean on certain things, but this will be her last sort of formal meeting in terms of, because we really wanted her to present the audit because it's such a terrific audit. Um, so kudos to her. Along those same lines, you all saw that uh, Chief Livingstone, Police Chief Livingstone, has announced his retirement. Um, so 46 years of service to one community is just remarkable. Um, he's a, he's a, a, an amazing leader um, and has really guided that department through some really challenging times with, with just enlightened, progressive leadership. So he's going to be hard to, to replace. I will be um, sharing with you some ideas on how to involve the community and how to move forward on that search process. It's a very, very, very important position. I recognize that. And I know the community will, will want to weigh in and talk about what kinds of characteristics they would like to see in the, in the next chief. So it, um, it, it will be the follow our normal department head that where the town manager appoints, the council will have the ability to either approve or disapprove the appointment. And that'll go through the normal process. Um, the last thing is we had the event on Saturday and um, it was um, it was much worse than it had been prior years. Um, typically it's more of a police event where we're managing crowds, which is what we did. And we were well prepared for that with um, multiple um, people, multiple agencies helping us. Um, the largest gatherings were at Townhouse in North Amherst and on South Whitney Street off of Main Street. There were lots of other uh, parties as well. Um, we had hoped that the weather was going to be in our favor because there was a, a parking ban the night before. There was snow on the ground. It was seen as a challenge and a 
make it even more fun, I think, by many of the people participating. People participating, we think were primarily, they were all student aged, but there was a large contingent that came from out of town. So there, it became more of a destination party for many people. It's a, this is a party that starts at, people start drinking at 6, 30, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning and then go throughout the day. Um, so we had our normal co uh, contingent of officers from the state police and our um, other agencies, plus the Crest Department was available, UMass Police. We have five, we usually go to five communities, Northampton, Belchertown, uh, Chicopee. Um, there's a couple, I forget all the names of them. Um, and that and that worked and that, that worked well, as I said. What was different this year is the huge number of uh, transports uh, for medical calls, um, which has not been the case. It has not been a medical um, event in the past. And that this was different. We had 38 total EMS calls um, for AFD, for Amherst Fire Department, 25 for transports to Cooley Dickinson. Um, of those 38, 28 were alcohol related. Um, we had our four paramedic ambulances staffed, plus two paramedic level engines, um, plus another engine all in duty. Uh, we had our normal mutual aid communities that were helping us sending an ambulance, Belchertown, Hadley, Northampton, South Hadley, South County EMS. There were so many calls from 11 to three, basically that one o'clock um, with the call spiking, we called for a regional EMS task force, which gets triggered through MEMA, which then is a statewide call. And it sort of was misleading because it, it to the people who were listening, like the press, they thought it was a mass casualty event, which is what usually you make one of these calls when there's a large, you need a whole bunch of ambulances. Um, but we had um, the task force responded with ambulances from Agawam, Chickabee, Longmeadow, Ludlow, West Springfield, and Westfield. This is a huge draw on resources from the entire region, which means those ambulances are in the town of Amherst. They're not in circulation in their own communities. We, we have not heard of anybody who did not get served in any of the communities who that, that participated, but it's still a huge drain. Um, Cooley Dickinson reported that they had 46 patients um, aged between 18 and 25 that reported that so that's our 30 uh, our 28 plus others who went on their own um, and that was the largest um, day they've ever had in their emergency department um, so uh, and we also on top of that we had 82 calls of service for police support so super busy day um, as I said in the email I wrote to you you would not have you couldn't have been prouder of the how your staff responded um, managed the crowds. At one point, they decided they needed to break up the crowd at South Whitney because it was so large, several thousand people. It was blocking the road. They had to just move them. And um, there, you have a lot of uh, young adults who are, have a lot of alcohol in them, but the police, incredible restraint, uh, just engaged in them and, and helped them move, start to move. And um, because at certain points, the crowds get so big, they feel like they have to address that. Um, so there were two arrests by the Amherst Police Department and two arrests by the UMass Police Department, um, both for, uh, I don't know, nothing major, just sort of alcohol um, by possession by a minor or something like that. They tried not to arrest. That's really not the business they're in. They're trying to help people enjoy themselves, but be, to be safe. That's the whole mantra that the police use. Um, so the, the big thing you might have heard is that it's called the Borg, you know, blackout rage gallon, which is um, a gallon of, of um, container of water that has water and vodka typically and other flavorings and Pedialyte and things like that. So uh, it was a uh, challenging day. Um, and so there was a pretty long meeting today with the, the primary responders having a debrief. We will have a debrief on our end. Um, we will debrief with the university. The university is having its own debrief or after, after action report. Uh, the Colleen Dickinson has asked for a meeting for us with us to talk of this through as well. So we are concerned about next year, but more importantly, we're concerned about this spring because with the universities, uh, usually they're by the end of April, they're pretty much done but this year they've extended that to Memorial Day. So there's four more warm weekends that we are um, 
conscious of and will have to prepare for. And it won't be as easy because these one day a year things where we get lots of all of our partners to send officers, um, they can't do that every weekend because they all get busy as well. So it becomes a real challenge for uh, the department. At that time, we have a no time off policy for our police officers, which is already, you know, we have a lot of vacancies for police and fire. So it's gonna be a stressful spring, I fear. Um, we have really good people who will step up, but um, it, it's, it's gonna take its toll. Um, we didn't hear, all, we had some complaints from neighbors, some people, some, mostly I think the neighbors or the people in the community were appalled at what they saw, but it, I don't think, and I think that we didn't have a whole lot of noise complaints or anything like that. So, um, but you may have heard more that you might wanna share, but it was a big event for us. Um, it got a lot of coverage um, and continues to get coverage as well. I mean, there's a new article in the Globe today about mostly focused on the new drinking thing. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, uh, we have several hands up. Anna? I, I'm fine if other folks have questions specifically about the this event, mine's not related. Okay, are there questions about this event? Dorothy, uh, uh, let me just start. Actually, Mandy Jo, you raised your hand. Yeah, um, one about this event and one not. Um, <clears throat> but first, a thank you to everyone who responded. Um, Alcohol is a, a dangerous thing. And to <clears throat> have to transport so many and, and deal with all of that. So thank you to all of our first responders. A um, couple of questions related to that, which is, does UMass contribute to the costs of managing this event? I don't know whether we have first, you know, like um, mutual aid costs, but also with all of the overtime, our own officers and our own CRESS and our own fire AFD have to do, do we see some financial contributions from UMass for this every year? And have you had a chance related to this, but other things to talk to or meet or have a discussion with the incoming chancellor and what will be on those discussions related to this and maybe some other things on a non-related one so I don't have to take the mic again. Um, you've had in your report a couple of times a flagpole policy um, mm -hmm. and the language changed this week, I think from the last time where you said you were developing it to this time where it's out to an attorney. Um, when is the council gonna see that? Because I would assume it's a council thing that has to be adopted since it's mostly on public ways and we're the keeper of the public ways. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I, I, the only time I met the new, in the incoming chancellor was when he was here for interviews and that was just, I was part of a group that was part of that interview. So nothing other than a hi, how are you type thing. In terms of charging, the university pays for all the overtime from the police departments that come to town. Um, the mutual aid is just seen as mutual aid. Those, each of those communities absorbs those costs. Um, we absorb the cost of the our Amherst Police Department that's working overtime. Um, and because most of the events are on town land, you know, it, or on, it's not on the university property. In terms of the flag policy, it is being reviewed um, by uh, Pamela Nolan Young wrote it. She did a really terrific job. Um, the question the town attorney had was whose policy is it? it um, because in, in, the, in the differentiation, so we have some flags that are on uh, the town building, which is the town manager. So typically this would be a select board policy, which equates to the executive, but there are the, the, our two main flag poles are on the town common. So they're looking at the charter and how and who controls what. So that's, that's their, what they're working on. Are there other questions about this past weekend, Dorothy, uh, no, Shalini, I think you're next and then Dorothy. So in the past, uh, I think UMass organized concerts to keep the students busy. And I wonder if they did that or will they be doing it in the, you were saying the other events coming up in spring? So there aren't other events. It's just warm weekends when people tend to gather in large parties. Uh, they did not do any counter program that I'm aware of this last on Saturday. Uh, Dorothy? Well, at a C C uh, community and, and campus coalition meeting, we they talked about this and had said it had been getting quieter and quieter the last few years. They weren't anticipating, knock on wood, anything more. 
I did say that I, you know, I, I, I still teach, as you know, felt a great urge amongst young people to get together again. And that I said, I hope you'd have a lot of exciting things happening on campus. Um, I did see driving down from Sunderland uh, on, I guess it was Friday night, that there was something on campus with a lot of people coming with those big, the Borgs, right? But, you know, in terms of what happened um, uh, on Saturday night, it was quiet on on my street, but on the upper ends on Fearing Street and North Prospect Street, um, it was not. Um, I, I tell you, besides, I think Mandy Joe's question about the money was one that was very big on my mind, which is, I don't see why the town of Amherst is paying the overtime for the Amherst police. I don't see that. And all these towns who lend their ambulances, do we ever have a chance to pay back by, um, does it, or are they all, are we going to always be in their debt? Um, do they call upon us? Does our ambulance go and help them? Um, and the, the last question is about the pictures that were in the paper were up at, I guess, um, the, the townhouses, the brick townhouses, and they had the um, wrought iron fences, which I believe had been put there as a way of crowd control. And when you mentioned the crowd of the big crowd of students, I just had this horrible thing. It says, you know, I guess it was Korea. Um, a bunch of kids got, it was at a concert or something, and they got crushed to death, um, I think, in the street. And I'm just thinking maybe it's time to rethink that big wrought iron fence um, because it didn't work and you could get crushed to death on it. I mean, the, the big crowds to me are terrifying. So those are the questions and comments I have there. So uh, to go backwards, is that that was a very strong, they had a lot of conversation back and forth uh, with uh, the fire department, police department, and um, the owners of the property uh, about whether that fence, they, they have gates on the fence, whether the gates should be open or not. And they had that, they were had pre-planned when they would open those gates because that concentration of people inside and the fear of there being uh, people trying to escape all at the same time through the same location was, was very real. So they were alert to that. Um, so... Um, the, the, um, so, and, and just rethinking the, the gates were put up at the request of the, our, um, community ser service officer thinking that that would hold people out. The only way you could get into that fight was going through someone's apartment. Um, so, but that was still the location, um, in terms of the, I forget what else, what the other ones were. The amb ambulance and mutual aid. Yeah, so a mutual aid. Yeah, so that's there's a whole system throughout the, the state. So there's the, the mutual aids where we have all the people that we call on and they can call on us. And we, if someone says we need somebody, we send an ambulance. We do that quite often, actually, and most often to Northampton or to Belchertown, depending on what is going on in their communities. We tend to be a, a, a recipient more than, a, a, than an offerer, but we do have a pretty robust system. Um, that where we can send uh, resources to other communities, especially the smallest towns when they have anything going on um, for fire or fire, especially for fire apparatus. Um, and so it, and then there's a, a broader statewide system, which is what we, this task force thing where like there was the um, fire and the Brockton hospital and they put out a call, they needed dozens of ambulances and everybody sort of sends, sends an ambulance. It, there, there is a lot of communication and, and support to because nobody can staff up for the worst eventuality. There has to be this mutual support. Um, Anna? All right, I'm gonna pivot us a little bit. Paul, um, in your town manager report, you gave an update on the community choice aggregation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to figure out if the JCE is is stalled right now, you're working on it, um, which would be great to kind of keep moving and that doesn't impact community choice aggregation is what's stalling CCA? Like why, where are we? Is it not stalled? Why? It, it feels like we haven't had a big move on it anytime recently. And I'm trying to figure out where the sticking spot is. Yeah. I'd have share. to get more details from Stephanie on it. Um, I think what she has done is, is pulled them apart and said the JPA. Right. It, JPE JP. isn't moving quickly, but she didn't want to hold back the, the, the community choice option. So I think she thinks that we can disentangle the two and move forward on the on the one. I'm not sure much more than that. If it's possible, I'd love to get an update on sure. that at, an, at a future meeting. Thank yeah. you. She has told me. I just don't. No worries. That's it's, it's totally fine. Thank you. And when you send the response, just 
CC the full council. Sure. Um, so, Paul, I do have one more question, and that is, for all these people that are transported by ambulance, does their insurance cover that? Do we get reimbursed for that? Yeah, so we, for all, all the people, no one was held overnight, according to Cooley Dickinson, so they're all processed, um, which indicates something, I guess. Um, yes, we bill, almost everybody has insurance, especially if you're a student, you mm -hmm. have to have insurance. Right. So we do, pro we do bill them and we'll collect from them. Okay, we had a, somebody asked that question yeah. in a email earlier today. Are there any other questions for the town manager for the his report? Okay, seeing none, uh, then we're going to go on to town council comments. Um, I did get you a president's report. Are there any questions with regard to the president's report? Anna. Thanks. Um, could you please go into a little bit of detail about the Amherst Media contract and the representatives from the Inspector General's office? Um, specifically, when is the, could you remind us, and I apologize for not knowing, when the contract is up and the interpretation, sort of what, what's being discussed in that and as, as you see fit. Yeah, I, I mentioned it in my, I, my report, Paul actually is much more involved, but so I'm going to look to you to answer the question uh, that Anna's asked. Yeah, so the contract between Comcast, so there's two contracts, one between the town and Comcast, which is a license agreement, and that expires in 2026, but the um, ascertainment process starts about 14 months prior to that, so that'll be, it could start a little bit before then. Uh, Comcast is going to give us a schedule for when they are going to file for their relicensing agreement. The um, contract between the town and Amherst Media is concurrent with that, but that usually happens after we've gotten the agreement with Comcast, so we know what kind of money is coming in, and then we negotiate the contract with uh, Amherst Media. Right now, there's an, a matter of interpretation about how we can use certain funds, capital funds specifically, because they are in a rental property that is privately owned. And um, so there's just some procurement issues that we've had, and they've had prior explanations from the Inspector General's office. Um, and so we had a meeting with the Inspector General, and it was different than how we were interpreting the Uniform Procurement Law. And so I think we just sort of said, let's get the Inspector General in and ask the question. And we pose the question as a group and give them some written documentation. And then the inspector general will come back to us and tell us what they think. And they also offered to talk to the attorney general's office too, to help us with our interpretation. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, then also let me mention um, that uh, WHMP is going to begin a segment where they do counselor comments, uh, where they interview counselors. And so um, I was, Andy's known the person that's do doing this for a long time. We both got an email and I'm meeting with him to talk about what that might look like. But over time, it does seem that it's not just something where these are this is counselors all over the valley okay all it's all of western mass but there may be you know maybe individual chairs of committees might be interviewed at some point or a certain topic or something like that but it's only once a month uh but i just wanted to mention that i had just recently gotten that contact um and trying to still sort through what um, that means for us and how we do that. Let me just mention, I did talk with Michelle earlier today. Uh, we are looking at, we are meeting tomorrow for the retreat. Um, the um, We've gone through a whole process of looking for uh, facilitators and have come up with the fact that Pamela Young will be our facilitator. And then we also, we're looking for how best to deal with having somebody who is not a counselor, who knows our rules of procedure and our charter and um, state law. And um, Athena has stepped to the plate. So the team for our meeting 
Paul will be there, but the team for the meeting, if you will, is um, Athena and Pamela. And we're looking at sometime early this week, you will be sent your reading assignment, which is going to be to reread the charter and to reread our current rules of procedure and some identified summary of Robert's rules. And then we aren't gonna require that you read all of Robert's rules. Then we're also going to collect from you questions so that we can collect, do those. So the beginning of the meeting will be clarify questions you might have. Then we get to, G, during GOL, there's already a starting of a list of what might be the topics related to this that would get discussed in the meeting. And um, it's called the cheat sheet at this point, which is not a good term at all, uh, but it's the kind of the list of topics, okay? And Pam, you mentioned one today specifically, and that will go on the list. The third portion of the meeting will be around priorities. And I need each of the committee chairs to send me an email. I'll send you a reminder. What are the open issues that your committee has on your agendas? All Anything that is still there, because as those of us who are on the council uh, as we ended our first term, we now need to be starting to consider what are we reasonably going to be able to get done? And there needs to be some level of status about how each of those things are disposed of or not dis are carried over to the next term. So that, and that will form the basis for a discussion about priorities. I don't have a whole lot more detail than that because the group that's planning this, which is Michelle and myself and Athena and Pam have not met yet, okay? And Pamela, but if you um, have this burning need to join us, please let me know. Pam, you have a question. I do. And, um... We have been carrying in the CRC a list of leftover items that have carried over from first council, right. none of which have been voted on by current council, none of which have been endorsed by current council. We've never really had a conversation about do we even want to see them? Mm -hmm. And so I periodically say, can we please just take those off when we're providing an agenda? We don't really want to be reminded of all this bird, this baggage from last council, um, but I've said it in a nicer way than that. Um, so yes, I'm so aware of the list. Do we have time before a retreat on the 25th to have a committee meeting, to have a committee discussion, and even get to those items, to even come up with a consensus of what our committee feels is a priority to carry over. And this would be a GOL. Yes. CRC. We GOL has items too. Uh, it may be that we're not going to resolve all of this even on the 25th, just to know. Yeah, I hear you. There's a few on that. Um, TSO even has a few that got carried over. Huh? Yeah. Um, so I don't have a satisfactory answer for you at this point. Um, Shalini. It's a related um, question to what Pam just, pa Pam just asked. Um, Pamela Young, Dr. Young. No, sorry. What am I saying? Okay, anyways, I'm really brain dead, but I do need to get this said. Uh, so regarding priorities, I've always been saying what is the criteria for priorities. And so that kind of talks to the question that, and I feel like as a council, again, what are the criteria we're using within committees to prioritize? And then I feel there's some input that's needed from Paul from the staff side in terms of timing, uh, costs, you know, what, according to the what the staff knows is the priority. So like, 
can we create some way that we do that? Uh, because again, as, as I've said earlier, committees that what I appreciate and I think it's really important for counselors to propose um, bylaws and policies, but there has to be a way that committees can discuss. And I think that's what Andy was also alluding to that uh, there needs to be a process or set of criteria that we agree upon. How do we prioritize as committees and as council as a whole? So maybe that's the first part of the discussion on priorities. Yes. Criteria. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Pam, you have your hand up still. Okay. Any other counselor comments in general? I want to note we're going to make it before 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm sorry, Dorothy, your um, question. Yeah. Just a, a quick comment to Paul to thank all of our staff, our police, our CRESS, our fire for dealing with this weekend. Um, because nothing, nobody died, okay? Um, and that's, well, that's important nowadays. It really is. Terrible Absolutely. things happening everywhere. So just l let them know that we appreciate what they did. We really appreciate it. Thank you. That's, we all we all agree with that one. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, seeing no other hands, the meeting is adjourned and it is 1049. Thank you. <laughs>